which says it is a disastrous or dangerous situation that drive government to respond by suspending normal governance protocols, systems and processes in order to control and uh, deal with the present danger or crisis. So that's what happens when a state of disaster uh, is, is declared. But here's one of the dangerous part. You then have a political executive that assumes even more powers that it is afforded by the Constitution because the situation is now dire. So for us to make quicker decision, some ministers will begin to have more powers that would in, so they don't follow necessarily your processes. Even during COVID-19, there were questions around means of accountability to parliament. But because it was a state of disaster, those powers were, were, were up accepted. The suspension of individual collective rights, you, you will remember during COVID, um, you, you couldn't move at any given moment you wanted. You'll be told you must be home by 10, or if you were in a location, you could have your mkombo to whisk away. I saw lots of police, and there were just soldiers all over the place, and some people. That's what the state of disaster in most cases. You, you have rights and responsibility that gets mixed up uh, in the process, uh, or the suspension of the transformation requirement simply because rather than saying that you need to have a BEE partner, you'll be told that we need to move as quickly as possible and therefore transformation gets compromised. So the issue here, colleague, is that we are actually part of this issue that gets us into a situation where we end up having this, disaster, this, this state of disaster declared due to non-performance. I'm focusing on the man-made, you know, created a disaster. So what is it that needs to be done? It, these, these are some of the issues that were raised after a similar discussion uh, were done at a conference on state capacity in Deben. One of them is that they, we need to prioritize the building of a capable state as a key foundation and the basis to advance the NDP. Uh, the second one was, is that we, we, start, we really need to start focusing on service delivery focal point. In most cases, when we do our monitoring and evaluation, we tick lots of boxes about m attending meetings. But how does that assist the guy who needs discipline at the clinic? Uh, the, the way that we do our own monitoring and evaluation we took, we took lots of boxes under the headlines of AOPs. But the question is, what is the impact? So the sooner that we begin to move uh, in, into the you know, impact of the work that we do uh, as government, uh, the, the better. OK, some of these things, you know men are not good with colors, eh? Yeah, so if I can read the. Uh, someone will have to forgive me. And I'm sure most of you are Christians. There's more obligation on you to forgive once I say I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see if I can see the next one. This thing, no. I'm sure you'll be happy that thank you is not far from, <laughs> from this line. OK. Uh, I know. Mr. Cuban, I think it's your fault. Oh, once. OK. <laughs> uh, OK, let me see if I can. Okay, working with agency. Uh, have we realized that we, we actually don't work with agents uh, as bureaucrats? I mean, I can ask someone. Actually, we don't. When COVID hit, it was the health workers that were in the forefront. Most preferred to work from home. It was a gain that, you know, here's this thing, I can work from home. And there was a lot of non-working from home. 
But when, you, you, and, and you know, Renisha, when you have a crisis like COVID, it brings to the fore a whole lot of things. For example, you, you realize that you, 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 you don't have enough clinics. So ideally, okay, you, 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 you think I can see from here? <laughs> You know, during COVID, we had to work with a whole lot of agencies because suddenly you couldn't have too many kids in one class, which means you needed to build more, more classroom. It means you couldn't have too many people clustered in one, in one, you know, a deep sloop, deep, deep sloot. So you needed to build more houses. It practically meant that you needed to provide water and sanitation. You can't say as government, you need to wash your hands, but you don't give them water. So the, 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 you, you, when people are clustered in one room, they need more of human settlements. That, that was the time when we should have jumped and worked with some serious sense of agency. Uh, after the Second World War, with the massive devastation of Europe in, on the infrastructure, the British Prime Minister said, uh, Churchill, he said, let's not let this good crisis go to waste. Have we made good cause of the crisis of, of COVID? And what happened when COVID, you know, was, you know, that protocol was relaxed? It became business as usual. We, we have to work with a sense of agency. And our agency must meet uh, the relevant, uh, you know, uh, norms, uh, norms and standards in terms of uh, the work that you do. And then we need to strengthen the role of oversight institution. So one of the things that the public protector complains about is that government, state organs, they, they hardly, you know, implement the remedial recommendation. So it's, it's, and she argues very strongly that, you know, if we have government that was going to do all of these things that we tell them to correct, the, the quality of service delivered would increase. So the role of your national assembly, provincial legislatures, and all those kinds of issues, uh, yeah, need to go up as much as possible. Um, you see, I told you, okay, where are my glasses? Here. Okay, so the next one I spoke about, the oversight institution, mainstreaming of government capacity programs and across national. In other words, what the conference says in Durban on state capacity issues is that each and every time a government institution plans, it must equally plan how it is going to perform maximally. So you don't just do the APP and you leave out the capacity, you must factor in as, uh, as a crucial uh, yeah, I know you are sabotaging me, it, it's now off. The other issue that we have raised, that they raised, is that government, we, we need, you need to be, to cut out this preoccupation with getting a clean audit to a point that you don't use the money. What is the point of getting a clean audit, you know, returning money to national treasury, but you have not done anything within the community, and that money was you know, put for development purposes. So that's, a, that's one of the issues that was raised. So as part of the way forward, we need to do that. And then of course, ac accelerate the professionalization of public service. And here we must make a distinction. Your qualifications do not make you a professional. Your attitude, the behavior, how you adhere to the norms and standards of the work that you do, it makes you a professional. You'll never have a doctor that uses an OCAP to operate, despite his qualifications. You have to use proper. So the same uh, applies to uh, public servants. So in essence, colleagues, whilst we are here thinking, conceptualizing, my request upon you is us please center yourself as the agent of transformation as the agent of state capacity building, as an agent of state performance, as the agent of trust between government uh, and the citizen. 
if you read the chapter 13 of the NDP, there's a, se there's a section there that speaks about the trust between the state and the citizen. And that trust, you don't get it by singing and jumping on a stage. You get it by delivering qualitative services. As Mandela says, it is in your hands. I think I've heard him saying this. But you know with Mandela, there are instances where they ascribe him certain quotes of what he didn't say. Uh, but this one he did say. I've heard him, but if he didn't say it, he didn't quote the person, but he said it. So he says, it is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. There's, a, there's an idiom from Kenya uh, uh, Jones. It says, uh, a wise man, I'm going to add woman and women, is the one who plants a tree, knowing very well that he won't be there to enjoy the shade. Please plant those trees. Thank you. Uh, another round of applause, colleagues. Thank you very much. You can take your... Thank you very much. Kuben, uh, I can't read your handwriting. Uh, oh, he said that you can take a paper. He said there are virtual participants online. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Dumisan. Yeah. The presentation that you made here. It's, it was just sitting directly to the relevant people because it's us who are bureaucrats. And I, I who have ever been in a rural community here, by show of hand, just raise your hand. I won't ask you which community. Only, only three people. Only, no, no. Okay, thank you very much. We have been the township. You just passed by the township or two, okay? Okay. So I assume all of you are, you are from the kitchen. You are from the the suburb. You know, when I was growing up, we used to call the suburb the kitchen because our mothers used to work there. So they used to work in the kitchen. So I said to myself, I will not want to stay in the kitchen. The time I grew up. So I'm raising this because if you have never been to the rural community, you've never been to the township, you won't understand what Dumasana is presenting. No. Many of you are kids. You know, one day I was driving with my young kid who we went to see the, the grandparent. You know, today's cars, when you, oh, you drive out of the tar road to the driver, it says you're off-road. Go back to the road. Do you know, today's cars, Robert, your car when you're driving, the moment you are going to the village, when you leave the taro, it tells you, no, you are now off-road. Can you go back to the road? So we are driving. So my child says to me, are we going to see the grain? I says, he says, do they stay in the, in the parks with animals? Why? Because you are driving through the bushes. Dead road. There's no road, by the way, as Dumisani said. There's no road. You must be drunk to drive in that environment. But people stay there. Many of your children stay behind the boom gate. You won't appreciate what Dumisani is presenting because many of you, you enter your houses through pin code. Many of is a reality. These are things, if you cannot confront, I can tell you the public service will get worse and worse and worse. Because many of you, you've got the private doctors. You know, you can call an emergency. Your kids, they are in the best school built by apartheid. It's a fact. 
So what was presenting, you know my job, AC kept referring to me, the title of my branch is called Government Service Access and Delivery. The scene is talking about Karuna was there. I went to Karuna a week before to prepare assessment. I couldn't drive. I could not drive. When we went back with the president, I was driving 160. So, I'm saying it is in our hands. I think by the end of this session, by Friday, Renisha, by next week, we'll see a different public service. You know, don't talk as third party. That's the problem of government officials. We create commissions, workshops, conference to solve the problem. Thank you very much, Dumisani. Really, uh, that presentation, you must expand it in terms of the interventions. One day we went to Deep Slot with some of the colleagues here. Deep Slot, it floods when there's no rain. Go to Deep Slot now, it's flooding. All roads are full of water. There's no rain. When we're walking that flood, now, the minister then says to the, to the council and the mayors, when we come back walking from the police station, this water must be closed. Committee says it was more than six months, this water flooding. When you walk back, the water was closed. It's not a joke. It's pain. You know, I don't know. I drive, whenever I drive, I I stop, I even ask, is there any cancer or some, something here? Because it touches me. We don't need a commission and a conference to solve our problem. We don't. So, we'll be here by Friday excited. Oh, wonderful colloquium. Oh, best colloquium. The report filed 18. When we go to the office, we file that report. Renisha call us again next year. Review of the conference of regulations. Regulations, as Dumisana says, they can't work. It's about your attitude. It's about your character. When you see something, take it upon your hand, pause, stop. Seek for intervention. You are a thought leader. Who have been to see then here? None. If you go to Sweden, you are a public servant. Do you know we've given you name tag, many of you here? All of you have got name tag, as part of The moment you knock your office, you remove your name tag. Why? Now, vice versa, in Sweden, they wear their name tag even when they go to the mall over the weekend, public servant. And then when the community see them, they salute. When Working, Mr. Mabunda, they are wearing. They look, Mr. Mabunda, they salute. Thank you. You look after us. Public servant in Sweden, they get saluted. In South Africa, in the public, you must know you can run fast. <laughs> if you forget your, your name tag, you must know in the mall you can run very fast. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm touched by what Demerson presented, so as I took those two minutes. Thank you very much, colleagues. I think we should move on, but we'll discuss, we'll ask questions. We must, we must provoke our thinking. You know, I don't like conference the way you go. It's nice, we eat, we exchange numbers. You know, you know it was nice. I don't like those things because it's not the reality. Please, let us not waste government resources by talking fake. You know, there are other, I listened to one premier talking this week, says, you have never seen a pothole in Northwest. You heard it. He says, I've never seen a pothole in Northwest. Is that the reality? But, but people clap hands, you know. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, don't make a mistake and make me frustrate your meetings anymore because I will drive you to the thought-provoking. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your chair. Face the reality. Whatever you're dealing with, when you go back, really, take it upon your hands. This country is a beautiful country. 
It's us sitting here who must make it change. Renisha, thank you very much. Let's welcome me with labor of hands. Sorry, Dumisan, I don't have your biography. I should read. They don't give me Renisha's biography. I could start reading, you know. Yeah, but nonetheless, thank you very much, Renisha. You can hold this. You can use this. It's up to you. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, good morning, DGs. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? No. Colleagues, you can hear me now? Okay. Um, good morning to DGs, DDGs, uh, heads of departments, colleagues who could uh, join us virtually as well, participants, invited guests, etc. I'm going to ride on all protocols observed to make sure that I'm told uh, that's the way out of invita greetings. <coughs> so, colleagues, I have been on a journey with the Office of Standards and Compliance for the past few months, um, acting as the chief director in the office. Um, I was overwhelmed by being asked today to speak and reflect on the state of compliance in the public administration and the role of the Office of Standards and Compliance. DDG, I'm using paper today, but the next time we'll make it uh, more technical. Um, so as we reflect, um, we are going to look at what DDG Schlopper has said. Is why do we exist as the public administration? What is our role in the context of, we talk state capacity, we talk about uh, things that the public administration must do, but what exactly are we expected to do and what, what tells us what we are expected to do? Um, as we reflect, it's important to look at what the Constitution says. So we get our grounding very distinctly from the Constitution. If we look at Section 195, it tells us what values and principles we should aspire to. These are exceptional values and principles. And like DDG Schlopper says, if we all abide by them, if we all live to these expectations, we should have a public administration that is delivering clean water, that is filling potholes, etc. But those values and principles talk about, for those of you who, who need a refresher, but they talk about delivering a high standard of professional ethics, efficient and eco economic and, if, um, and effective use of resources. It talks about delivering services that are impartial, fair, equitable. So when we go to different areas in South Africa, we should be able to experience public service exactly the same. But in reality, that doesn't happen. Some of us in the kitchens um, get better services. Those not in the kitchens don't get as good service. And the question we should ask ourselves as public service is why, when our constitution demands of us that, that we do that. When we look at section 195, it says to us, we are expected to have legislation that takes into account and regulates the public administration. Then you look at section 197 and it says, and drills deeper into those constitutional values and it says, within this public administration, we must have a public service that functions, that is structured by national legislation to deliver and execute its duties um, lawfully and, and in a manner that delivers services. Then you go back and you look at section 152 and it says um, local government is required to provide democratic, accountable government for local communities. Ensure that services to communities is sustainable. So when you build a road, the, build, the road should, should stay a road for at least a couple of years to promote social and economic development, to promote a safe and healthy environment, um, 
to encourage communities to be involved and to participate in local government. And the question we should ask ourselves is, are we achieving these responsibilities that the Constitution places on the public administration? What becomes evident if you look at all of these sections, what the Constitution is saying, is that we have to work together as organized government. So when Dumisani talks about the state and government, we have to collaborate. We have to bring the administration within the context of state and government. Um, looking at the Constitution, uh, and I, I think Dumisani, I'm going to write back to, to what Dumisani has said, is why do we exist? And I think that's a question as we go through this colloquium, we must really reflect on, on that, is why do we exist? These expectations on the cons from the Constitution are non-negotiable. We don't have a choice. We don't get to say, today I'd like not to abide by Section 195, or I would like not to abide by the Public Service Act, etc. When you look at the Constitution, it talks to enacting many rules that must govern this public administration. So we do that. We have wonderful rules. We have the Public Service Act. We have the Public Administration Management Act. We have the PFMA. We have the MFMA. We have the Municipal Systems and Structures Act. So we have multitudes of acts. And within each of these acts, we have numbers and numbers of norms and standards. And I wonder whether the public servants read these pieces of law. Even if it doesn't apply to you in the public service, do we read what the Municipal Systems Act requires? When we are in the municipalities, do we read what the Public Service Act says? Because if you don't have an understanding across the administration of all these norms and standards and how they integrate with the ultimate goal of providing services, then we really are failing the citizens of South Africa. So today, as I reflect on the state of compliance in the public service, one of the things that I've done is that I've reflected on what the AG has said in the past two consolidated reports dealing with municipalities as well as national government. And when the AG does their consolidated report on national government, they include public entities. So, so we'll talk in that context. Uh, there's other institutions also that we need to reflect on. What is the public protector saying about the public administration? What is the public service commission saying about the public administration? Do we read those reports? Do we digest it? What do we do with those reports? Do we park it in file number 13? Um, so, so the question that we, we really have to ask ourselves is, are we interrogating and reflecting on ourselves as public administrators? Um, so as we look through the AG's report, I've picked certain areas that I think are important for us to reflect on. The AG's report primarily is, is how we look at the state of compliance across the administration. It's how we measure ourselves. We look at our audits. We look at, are we doing well? Are we having clean audits? Are we having material findings and what? But what do we do about these reports? So for example, in the national and provincial departments, including public entities, for 2021, um, the AG has issued a consolidated report, which finds that they've instituted something called material irregularities. They've done it but, uh, for uh, municipalities as well as um, for the public service as consequence management. So when the AG ref uh, reflects a material irregularity, it holds HODs and municipal managers personally accountable for those material irregularities. And it has a process within that to make sure people conform to all these rules and regulations. The the, the provision is fairly new, so people are, are finding ways to, to adapt to this new system. But what the AG reflects on is that consequence management is driving compliance, is that there is this material irregularity process, and it's ensuring and it's, it's reaching the goal of getting 
better compliance. It hasn't achieved it 100%, but it's, it's a method that is being used by the AG to get compliance. Um, the AG also raises the issue of inadequate service delivery and planning across government, including reporting and oversights. Um, and it, it talks about how the public administration does not deliver on its mandate. So we make all these promises in our APP. We say we are going to achieve one, two, three in year number one of the MTS, for year number two of the NTFs. And the question is, is that compliance with an activity in your APP, is it really a measure of how you are delivering services? Is it a measure of your true performance as a department? Are you achieving what you were established to do? And Dumisani again reflects on, are we doing what is expected of us? Um, and the AG says, not really. You're making commitments in your APP and your AOPs that are not really having an impact on service delivery. Then when you look at infrastructure, the AG raises an issue about the state of our infrastructure as, as government. Do we have enough infrastructure that allows for service delivery to take place? So do we have enough schools? Do we have um, enough hospitals? And what's hampering our delivery? Because we have budgets allocated. So what is hampering our infrastructure? Why is our roads in such a bad condition? Why are there um, not enough, why is there not enough equipment in hospitals? And, and part of, of what the AG has raised as contributors to this is the way we manage projects. The way we as public servants deal with money. We take a project, we cost it wrong, we don't make sure that we contract manage it properly. Time runs out. We don't do any consequence management. And ultimately, we have poor services and poor maintenance. Then the AG raises uh, a fourth point and says, in this constrained environment where our fiscus is constrained, we are exacerbating that constraint as public servants by not ensuring that we do simple things, like pay an account on time and avoid the interest charges. Um, make sure that we don't create obligations where we have contingent liabilities. We are being sued for many things because we don't do the things that we are supposed to do or expected to do in the first place. So we end up with overspending our budgets, poor, uh, a poor health in terms of our finances, and then we, we just make our financial situation that much more difficult. And the last one that the AG raises as substantive is our governance and accountability. And colleagues, I think this is important, is that we don't hold each other accountable and we don't hold ourselves accountable. When we don't come to work or we come to work late with no reason, no explanation. We don't, our manager doesn't hold us accountable. We don't hold ourselves accountable. And those are things that ultimately affect the public service and the public administration. We look at issues of cybersecurity. What are we doing in those areas? Um, we look at our governance structures, our oversight on SOEs. What are we doing to manage those? Um, this slide I've, I've taken directly out of the AG's consolidated reports, and it's a snapshot of the outcomes of audit processes, uh, both in the public service, so that's your national and provincial government, as well as your SOEs. And you'll see in these slides, it talks about 74% of institutions that are receiving unqualified and, and clean audits. But when you look at the expenditure trends, it appears that at least 34% of the overall expenditure resides with the 35 institutions, or the six as, as it sits there, that have outstanding or disclaimed audits. So if you look at the worst performing audits, that's where the bulk of your money, or at least 34% of your money is being spent. And what does that tell us? And, and just for 
for interest disclaimed audits are the worst type of audits you can get because what the AG says is they can't even rely on the credibility of the information that is provided in that audit process. In respect of local government, again, the AG has instituted material irregularities, uh, processes to manage it, and they, they believe that it's achieving some result. Um, financial reporting is also poor, and in municipalities, it's been raised in the context of appointing consultants to do work and to manage financial reports, but not really getting back the value for that money. Uh, in terms of, again, the financial health of municipalities, it is reported that at least 28% of munis municipalities currently are in a dire state and may potentially be unable to continue operations. And colleagues, 28% is a big number. The AG flags also information technology controls. We all talk papaya, we talk about paya, we talk about our right to privacy. But what are we doing in the IT space to manage those things? What are we doing to manage our information? We talk about knowledge management. So we have all these fancy concepts that come into the public administration. But the question is, what do we do with all of these things? IT is our big spender. We buy computers, we buy laptops. Who is interrogating whether we are getting value for money, whether we are, um, that those IT Equipment that we buy are, are user-friendly. Are they working within the systems of government? Is the license val value for money? We don't do those inter interrogations. We just need a license. We buy it no matter the cost. Service delivery planning, again, in municipalities, not aligned to the integrated development plans, not aligned to the budget implement implementation, not aligned to service delivery. So again, you have fancy plans, but nothing really materializes out of them. And the indicators are not clear enough to measure your performance. So you would find your, you have a clean report, but what has been the impact of your clean report to service delivery? Does it correlate? Should, but does it? In terms of service delivery in municipal infrastructure, again, there's a trend that grants are not fully utilized. So when Dumisani raises the issue about we have the money and we don't spend it because we're trying to manage the auditing process, that has an impact directly on what you promise to deliver and you are not able to deliver. Um, in terms of um, the remaining issues that the AG raises in terms of municipalities. Um, service delivery disclaimed municipalities indicate that there's no proper asset registered. So simple things like managing your assets. Managing the properties we own as the state. We don't have those, those basic things. So how are we going to know that we have facilities that are able to then deal with uh, things like our waste management, deal with... Um, service delivery, deal with points where we could use, or buildings we could use, or facilities we could use as government to ensure that we leverage on what we have. In terms of procurement and payment transgressions and risks, the uh, risk reflect ineffective control measures, expenditure is not the most cost effective, and awards made are in contravention of, of prohibitions. So if I am not allowed to do business with the status, as an employee, you find that government still awards me a contract. What are we doing to make sure that we abide by those rules, that we, we, we start to reflect our, in our behavior these changes, not just by making sure that rules are implemented? And the last issue that, that the AG raises in terms of local government is an assessment of accountability and consequences. And the AG says there that there's a lack of consequence management where debts are not investigated, debts are not recovered, and, and there's instability at municipal manager level, which then results in not having adequate oversight over the recovery of funds. In terms of, again, the a consolidated report, there's a snapshot of where we are with local government, and this, colleagues, is the 20, um, 
2020 to 2021 uh, report. Um, the slide here pr provides that 54% of institutions at a local government have received unqualified and clean audits. Um, but they utilize at least 74% of overall expenditure, while 5% of overall expenditure resides with 34 institutions which make up 14% of your total local government institutions where there's outstanding or disclaimed audits. And I want to reflect that in 2021, COCTA issued a report that said 61 municipalities are dysfunctional. And again, colleagues, I think these are things to, to note um, as we proceed. Um, so as I said, in addition to the Auditor General, we've also had um, reports from the Public Service Commission, reports from other institutions. But of importance are the reports from the Public Service Commission, which looked at ethics and recruitment processes. It's given us guidance on what can be done better, what's not working. Um, effectiveness on continuous employment, employee development. How are we enhancing capacity in the public administration? Um, there's also a guide such as um, how to deal with unlawful instructions. So coming on the back of the Zondo Commission report, how do we deal with unlawful instructions, unethical dilemmas? How do we deal with managing those unlawful instructions? Um, the PSC has also done a report and an analysis on en enablers and disablers, or inhibitors, they call them, of performance of senior managers. And they've listed, and I think it's quite a good read, um, they've listed quite a few things that they have done research on and found what really stops us from doing what we are expected to do as the public administration. So they've identified inhibitors, which they talk to in terms of our organizational cultures, do we have the competent people in place, do we have um, the necessary support, is our organizational structures correct, is the work assigned to us properly assigned? Is the morale of staff um, addressed? Um, and then they look at inhibitors, uh, such as, um, or enablers rather, that talk to um, prompt and constructive feedback. So as managers, these are simple things we could do. Um, teamwork and collaboration. Um, um, recognition of peers and superiority, uh, superiors, and exposure to training and development opportunities. These are little things that could go a long way in making sure that a culture of belonging is in, 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 entrenched in the public service. So colleagues, as I'm uh, moving on, um, the outcomes of these reports uh, must find expression in, in what we do. So when we talk about norms and standards, et cetera, are we using these reports to reflect on our behavior, to reflect on what is expected of us? Um, in terms of the Office of Standards and the role that the Office of Stand, uh, Standards is expected to play in, in this particular space, um, I want to refer um, colleagues and inform you that the Office of Standards was created by statute. So it's a statutory body that was established under the Public Administration Management Act and its regulations, which Kuben is going to talk to after me, have been enacted since 2022. Um, the Office of Standards has these main functions that I've highlighted here. But what the Office of Standards is required to do is as a baseline, it's intended to take the findings of these institutions and to determine to what extent these frameworks work. Are these frameworks, are our norms and standards as the DPSA, as the COCTA, as the National Treasury, are all these norms and standards working? Are they achieving what they're supposed to achieve? Or have they become redundant? Have they become inappropriate? And that is what part of the work of the Office of Standards is expected to do. 
The other part of the Office of Standards is required to conduct capacity and functionality audits on skills, systems, processes, and advise on capacity building initiatives. And this means that the OSC doesn't just look at the appropriateness of norms and standards, but rather the whole value chain of what could debilitate the state, such as lack of skills, lack of systems, and the wrong people in the wrong place. Um, achieving compliance and monitoring compliance is the third pillar on which the Office of Standards stands. So to this extent, the Office of Standards has developed and is in the process of developing an early warning system that is able to simplify the tracking of non-compliance. Um, the focus of this work is to create an awareness of impending challenges before they occur, so we don't want to know when you've completely failed as, as an institution. We want to know before you fail so that we can put in place interventions that are going to support you to ensure that you do not fail. So that's the purpose of the, office, of the early warning systems that are being developed. It's a system that's envisaged to cr cut across the entire public administration uh, with the hope that we will alleviate non-compliance and we will uh, assist departments where they need assistance before they reach a crisis point. Um, in terms of the work of the Office of Standards and how it relates to other institutions within government, the work of the Office of Standards is not to replicate work of the AG or the Public Service Commission or the Public Protector, but it is expected to leverage on what these institutions are saying. So if they are saying to us, something is wrong with our norm and standard, the Office of Standards must look at those. Um, and ultimately, the goal of, of the Office of Standards is to ensure that we get a professional, ethical, capable, and developmental state. Um, as I move to, to concluding, and, I, and I'm hoping that, as DDG Pokela has said, we will start to have these solid engagements. So I leave you with some questions, and I'm hoping by the end of this colloquium, you will have internalized it and you will explain it and you would be able to react to some of these questions. So when we say compliance, does our compliance, so does our compliance translate to better service delivery? If, is it a legitimate expectation that if we comply with every rule, every norm and standard, every prescript within the public administration, that we will achieve a public administration that is fully functional, that is giving our citizens and the people of South Africa everything that they want. Because that's the purpose of norms and standards. It must enable you to reach the 100% goal of absolute proper service delivery. And are we achieving that? Uh, in terms of um, service delivery failures, can these be linked to non-compliance? Or is it that we have inappropriate norms and standards? Or do we have ineffective rules? And I think those are discussions hopefully you'll get some answers to. But as I conclu uh, conclude, colleagues, I, I want to, to raise um, a, a, a paragraph out of the AG's report, where the AG reflects and says, a clean audit is not always an indicator of good service delivery and does not always correlate directly to the lived experience of all communities in a municipal area. However, we have seen that municipalities with institutionalized controls and systems to plan, measure, monitor, and account for their finances and performance and stay within these rules often have a solid foundation for service delivery. When this is the case, municipalities can focus on ensuring the delivery of quality services to all of their residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, a clap of hand, please, for Renisha. Thank you very much, uh, Renisha. Colleagues, uh, I'm told 11 o'clock uh, the deputy minister must join. 
I think she'll present virtually. It's 10 to 11. And there is one uh, item that I can, uh, thought I can deal with and then before we can break for tea, I go for panelists and da 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 da. So I need guidance. Uh, whether I should call Kuben now, uh, but will be interrupted, I'm not sure because I'm not sure how lengthy is your presentation. Thank you very much, Renisha. We really appreciate that, uh, how you map the constitutional prescript, the policy on the norms and standard policy and the self-delivery issues and the AG reports. So, hence we are here today. We will need to leave this auditorium by Friday with a clear mind to say, what are the impactful issues that we need to resolve? to better our service delivery out there. That, that's the bottom line. The main issue is safe delivery. It is what brought us here. So compliance should be part of those. So Kuben, you want to come now? Please come and take the floor. Compliance is very important, but it should not be done in a malicious way on expensive delivery. So let me take this presentation by Kuben, and therefore uh, uh, the Deputy Minister will just give us the proper opening and everything that will proceed. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kuben. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, greetings to all of you. Uh, present uh, physically. We have a large number of people uh, connected virtually. Uh, M Moses, can you tell us how many people is connected virtually? 71. 71 people are joined virtually. So also greetings to them. Uh, you'll remember COVID has forced us to uh, think differently about our conferences, hence we use a blended method and uh, try to expand and connect with as much people as we can. And that 71 is from various provinces uh, in the country. Uh, let me uh, firstly make a confession. My presentation, I was warned by Renisha, the head of legal services, not to frighten you about the regulations. So what I'm about to present is not about policing institutions and not about going and interfering with your work because we, you, as you all know, each institution has its own mandate, has its own powers and, its own and it takes its own responsibility to do whatever it's supposed to be doing. Uh, what I'm about to present is just about to enable and support those institutions to do better. So that is a confession we want to make up front around, uh, uh, around why we are, we had to take a decision to develop uh, regulations. Uh, let me maybe first start by saying the Office of Standards and Compliance is a very young baby in the DPSA. It was established and operationalized uh, on the 1st of April 2020. And the office needed to have its own regulations in order to execute the functions as per the Public Administration Management Act of 2014, uh, especially the functions of the, of, of the office, which, is, uh, as, uh, which Renisha has mentioned in, in her presentation, the six functions in Section 17.4. This, these new regulations that we are about to uh, go through and discuss with you today was approved, as Renisha mentioned, around about October 2020. So they are very new. Uh, one of the main objectives of this conference or this uh, colloquium, uh, because this first part is about presentations, we're going to go into an engagement and question and answer session with the panel later where we will raise all our issues to those panelists and the specialists that we have. Uh, the main function is to, to start getting the work going and, and, and executing our mandate. So the, 
the purpose of this presentation is to highlight the key elements of this OSC or the Office of Standards Regulations 2022. That's what we call it. And also bring about uh, some awareness on the implications of some of these to you and your organization that you belong to. Uh, the value chain, uh, Renisha explained the six functions of this office, but the value chain is very simple. We first start with monitoring compliance. And our office, through my colleague, uh, Ms. Matloha, uh, who is going to present later on, a, on, on her two uh, compliance monitoring reports that she's managed to do over the last two years, where she's picked up trends and, and, some, and she's going to make some recommendations as an office on how we're going to deal with that. The other part of it is to promote the office which we are doing today. One of the key objectives of today's uh, colloquium is to promote the office, to promote the regulations in particular and its implications, and also then to look at ways on how we're going to come and support institutions that are struggling and need our support and assistance. The other function, as Renisha mentioned also, is to conduct capacity and functionality audits. Uh, this is not like what the AG does. It's something totally different. Uh, these audits focuses on the skills, systems, and the processes to improve compliance in particular, but as an organization as a whole. And of course, then we'll identify gaps and support that it needs to be provided to that institution. And the other function that we have in the value chain is the enforcement. We'll talk about the regulations on how we have made it a simple process to come and start the enforcement of compliance. And eventually to evaluate in the cycle, evaluate the appropriateness to check whether those policies, whether those prescripts that we are issuing both as a DPSA or your institution, if there is non-compliance, is it a design or a structural problem in the actual prescript itself that is creating the non-compliance. Hence, we have this function to evaluate the appropriateness and then to develop an, a report on its appropriateness using a, a tool and a scoring tool. So why the need for, uh, for regulations, you might ask. Renisha did say this office was created by an act, by legislation. So it needed to be given some regulations for us internally to know how we must do our work and for you who we're going to come and assist and support how we're going to actually uh, support you as as you know parma uh, 2014 section 17 6 states the main object of this office are to ensure compliance with minimum norms and standards but taking into account that the spheres of government are distinctive, interdependent, but yet very interrelated. So we are very cognizant of this very important principle, and this is the core principle in which the Office of Standards and Compliance will work and abide by while we are doing our work. We do understand each institution Every accounting officer is accountable for their institution and they're accountable to do whatever they're supposed to do there. We will work with them to improve uh, uh, any area of compliance where we can within our, our capabilities and within our own uh, constraints and, and, and our own uh, uh, amount of uh, time and, 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 and people power that we have. Uh, the, I tried to do the presentation without not bringing too, too much of subjective elements in it, but to stick to the regulations as it is. And you know, legal people like that, uh, you stick to what is there so nobody can tell you you, you are interpreting something different. So the Office of Standards Regulations has four sections. We first have, uh, we, will, we will circulate the, the, 
the the regulations and all the presentations to all the to to the participants because we have your email address the detailed one the presentation is just to summarize uh, what is in there it has various definitions that will help you to have a conceptual understanding of some of the terms the second part of it talks about the power and functions of the office the third one talks about access to premises, vehicles, documents, and employees. And the fourth one talks about compliance and deals with various elements of compliance and how we're going to start this new element of enforcement, which is working together with you to bring about this enforcement process. Colleagues, let me skip the first section with the definitions and go into section two of the, of the regulations, which talks about the powers and functions of the office. The first function of the, of the head of the office, uh, by the way, this office in terms of the legislations calls the person in charge the head of the office of standards and compliance or what we call the office in inverted commas. Our first main function is to advise the minister on the determination of minimum norms and standards. And also to advise the minister on enforcing uh, the, the enforcing of compliance with these minis, uh, minimum norms and standards. So this advice will of course go through our director general of the department because we are within the department and of course if there is need for other areas that we need to bring on board and advise the minister to do, we will do it through this particular function in the regulation. And the second function is to assess the appropriateness of minimum norms and standards and public administration norms and standards. The minimum norms and standards are those issued by our minister and the public administration norms and standards by our definition in our regulations is those ones issued by your executive authority. To also ensure that the office promotes, monitors and take the necessary steps to secure compliance with minimum and public administration norms and standards. And in order to give effect, we need to report regularly to the, to the minister. And in our regulations, we're talking about quarterly reporting, uh, um, uh, yearly reporting and so forth. But F also is very important, the report to the minister on number three, on the progress made in any investigation and finalization of matters brought before the office. So that's the first section of the regulations. That is section two. Section three talks about the access to premises, vehicles, documents and employees. Now we're getting into the interesting part of the regulations trying to give us the practical ways on how we must give effect to the mandate of our office. It firstly states, number one, every head of institution must cooperate with the office. It's not saying shall, may, it's saying must. And legal people will explain to you what does what must mean and what does the other two of shall and may mean. It means giving the office full and unrestricted access to all at all reasonable times to any document, book, or written or electronic record or information relevant to our capacity and functionality audit that we our office will be conducting. And any employee and any employee in the office seeks to interview for the purposes of monitoring or auditing. So it talks about the access, the head of department as the accounting officer facilitating this process of access to these things that I mentioned, including people who we need to, to engage with during whatever we are there to do. The office may, in the performance of the function under this act or this regulation, also subject to the approval of the relevant executive authority. We built in this element of bringing the executive authority in the regulations, uh, that the executive authority should be brought into on board if there is a need for this one year in particular. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not going to be forced to do all these things uh, and somebody else is going to do them. Enter any property, premises or vehicle 
where a document, book, or written or electronic record is kept, or to interview an employee direct in person to produce or to deliver at a specific place and time and in any specific format, any such document, book, etc. Inspect and question any person about any such document, book, copy or make extracts from that book, etc. Copy and make extracts from the book or written and or any records. Direct the person to disclose either orally or, or in writing any information that will be needed for the investigation. Direct a person to disclose those information or give answers to questions in terms of, of this subsection in writing or under oath and, and, and so forth. So that is the second part, the third part of the regulations. Then the regulations end up with the compliance section, which is section four where it talks about after monitoring compliance or conducting a capacity or functionality audit, the office must report to the minister and the head of the institution, which may include directions on the steps to be taken by the head of the institution to comply or to build capacity in whatever area that has been identified. Part two, the directions may include time periods within which the corrective steps must be taken, B, time periods within which the head of the institution must report on steps to be taken, and if, if not reasons for not doing so. Number three, if the directions are not implemented, the office will investigate the reasons for the failure to implement and submit a report to the executive authority, the HOD, which may include an enforcement response plan. And that plan will be a plan that will be developed with the institution that the office is working with. Failure to implement the enforcement response plan will be the office may issue a compliance order. If you know in government a department like labor is, is a department that issues compliance orders. Uh, especially on life-threatening situations that come with chains, lock up your buildings, close everything down and shut everything down. We're not going to be doing that, by the way. So this is about an order that is now going to give you fixed timelines to work towards reaching that target that, that you need to resolve uh, within that timeline. And finally, if the institution fails to comply, then the office may submit this, this report to the minister, the executive authority, the minister responsible in local government, or MEC for local government, uh, if it is a municipality. Uh, and I think Renisha did mention in her presentation, the OSC has this, this uh, uh, mandate to go and work with all three spheres of government. Of course, respecting those, 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 the principles that we mentioned. And the Public Service Commission, if, if it's the public service that is, uh, that is the national and provincial departments which are non-complying. So those are basically uh, what, what the, 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 the regulations, as it is in the regulations, I've pulled it out and, and, and presented on it using uh, this, this format. So, uh, colleagues, the main function then coming to the office is to support institutions, and we must stress that. Uh, as a DPSA, we are clear that each institution is responsible for their own areas of their work. In, they are responsible for the, for, the, for the performance of their own institutions, especially the accounting officer there. But we are there to support these institutions in building in building blocks to improve compliance uh, with the focus on compliance monitoring systems, processes, and skills in particular. And, and finally, in conclusion, you might ask then where do you start? When are you, are you going to come to us anytime soon? Uh, the answer is in this slide. The OSC will identify through its compliance monitoring reports which my colleague is going to present uh, uh, later on, on the reports that we have done, and also identify non-complying institutions 
through other reports, like the Auditor General's report, which Renisha has focused a lot on in her presentation. And we use even the Public Service Commission reports and other reports, either Human Sciences Research Council reports and others, where we will identify and pull together and triangulate all this data to bring about identifying specific institutions that will, will need our support first. While we are setting up this compliance monitoring system in the DPSA, uh, together with an early warning system, when it is up and running, it will be much more helpful because it will just give you red flags. Uh, uh, please go to DDD Mshlongo there in social development. There is problems there. The system will tell us that DDG. So we can be able to come there without you even asking us to come. So we're hoping that system will come up and running. So uh, colleagues, uh, that is in short, keeping it short, my presentation. We're wanting to just uh, uh, highlight and promote these regulations. We will forward the regulations as it was approved and, uh, and as, it was, as it is so that you can actually verify. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kuven. Uh, a round of applause for Mr. Governor, please. Yes, uh, your presentation was short. I think we appreciate that. I, I need to be guided, colleagues, uh, especially those who are running uh, logistics, if the DM is online. <coughs> I mean, I cannot be on the stage while the deputy minister is online. That's a career limiting. I still aspire to to work in government. And <laughs> yes, yes, Nico. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, it's quite true. I mean. I'm a career public servant. I joined government in level one. That's why I don't know anything except government. Uh, <clears throat> level one. Many of you are like you are joining intern. I'm probably intern at level eight somewhere there. That's the manager's position. When I was in level one, I used to aspire to, to be at level five. You know, that position used to be called admin officer. To see if I'd be level five. I can retire there. So that was my aspiration. Thank you very much. It's for those who don't understand that really, some of us, we understand how government works. That's how we're passionate. Okay. We're doing well. We have done the first part. We need to go to the panelists. But while waiting for logistics to put in the DM online, I will recommend that we break for tea. Uh, my clock is quarter past 11. Uh, we're using the, not the African watch, by the way. Um, I'm not sure if you can give 15 minutes, it's fine. 15 minutes, half past. I mean, half past, we're not coming. Sorry, I'm still talking. I suppose we're standing up. Half past, we're not coming back. We're starting. So, DM is online now. Okay. Uh, uh, communication. I'm advised here yeah, that DM will start at half past. Okay. Half past, we are not working in. We are starting our session. I think if we can move in that order, it will be very good, uh, uh, public servant. Thank you very much. Let's break for tea. We are back here, 28 past, half past start. Thank you very much. Yes, now you can stand. Now, now you can stand. Now you can stand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, I'm told those who went to the washroom, somebody, because you carry a lot of phones, you forgot the other one in the washroom. So there's other one you left there.
for those who didn't register, there are barcodes on the wall. Just scan the barcode places online. Thank you very much. Thanks, Abut.
Thank you very much, colleagues. Let's take our seats. We should now proceed. Um, let's just be seated. Thank you very much. We agreed that we will be back here by 28 past just to take that two minutes walk to your chair. And therefore, we allow the deputy minister to give her address. And therefore, I'll give guidance in terms of the next, next move to do. I'll be guided by communication. I don't see most as soon as deputy minister is online so that we can diligently listen to, to the marching orders from the executive. Can I quickly check if there is anybody here who joined government at the rank between one and three? <laughs> Only two people. Two people. And then three and five? Only three, four. Okay, six and eight. Oh, you can see now. This is where many of you were in ten. You came with that program of intensive levels eight. Okay. No, it's fine. Uh, yeah. It, it's very important to understand how, how government evolves. I know now people join government at level, level 13. The first day he joined the very same government, started criticizing the very same department. The very same day, so why, why do you think? Do you think it's a delivery? No. The very same day this guy joined government at level 13, he criticized the very same department of, on the first day. So as we indoctrinated, the passion you built in, how you must protect this legal person called government. When DDG Tropas presented this difference between the state and government, people don't know that these two are different. There's a big difference between the state and government. A difference between the public service, public administration. So if you join at level 13, go back to level 2, 3, understand the dynamics and operations. But thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We really appreciate your, your, your cooperation. I'm just waiting to get a signal that the DM is online. I can take my, my seat and therefore we listen to to the to the deputy minister yeah i hope you've got your questions your clarity seeking for the previous presentations because after that we'll go to that mood where we interrogate the previous presentation thank you very much uh, i get a the dm is ready i think i'm offline Thank you very much, Program Director. Um, and good morning to all. Allow me to take this opportunity to recognize uh, the Acting Minister uh, of Public Service and Administration in absentia. Uh, who will be in the position to join uh, this conference and colloquium tomorrow, uh, the Director General of DPSA, MS Yolisa Makasi, and heads of broader MPSA family, uh, the NSG, CPSI, and Public Service Commission, Director Generals and heads of departments here pre present today, all our partners, including public sector, education and training authority, Reginesis, Birds, University of the of Northwest, and Twan University of Technology. Researchers, invited guests, and speakers, all participants, including those on the virtual platform. Ladies and gentlemen, 
In his State of the Nation address, on the 9th of February, 2023, President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa said, a professional public service staffed by skilled, committed, ethical people is critical for an effective state and ending corruption, patronage, and wastage. He further stated that, in line with State Capture Commission response, a framework for professionalization of public service has been developed with the sole mandate of integrity assessment, assessments as a requirement for recruitment into the public service. Program director, on the onset, um, let me just say that I need to apologize for having uh, joined too late uh, because I had the portfolio committee meeting where I was representing the minister this morning. I hope whatever I'm going to be saying to you this morning will actually manage to connect with work that has already been done up to this point. Public service and administration in South Africa has evolved since 1994 with key focus on integration, integration needed to redress the disparities of the past and discriminatory practices. With the dawn of democracy, public service needed to change and adapt to key values and principles of transparency, inclusivity, as espoused in the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. It is these values and principles based on the spirit of Ubuntu, together with high-powered state capacity that should enable public service to perform effectively and efficiently in delivery of basic services to the people of South Africa. For government to deliver its mandate of effective and efficient public service, it must professionalize uh, public service. It must be effective and efficient in the use of resources. Public service must be development oriented, impartial in the provision of services, responsive to the needs of the people, accountable, transparent, and representative of the people of South Africa in order for it to become a viable mechanism for meeting the basic needs of South Africans. The Department of Public Service and Administration regulates national norms and standards for public service institutions in line with the National Development Plan 2030 that calls for building a capable, ethical, developmental state. It is therefore, it therefore becomes imperative in our endeavor to achieve these goals to make an audit of the successes and the failures to be able to understand what still needs to be done. The Office of the Standards and Compliance is based on the need to agree on common understanding and definition of norms and standards with all stakeholders assess appropriateness of minimum norms and standards, create capacity to support the minister in, describe, in prescribing uniform minimum norms and standards across public service and administration, availability of technical support, advisory service, and intervention support to promote compliance and ensuring that norms and standards are designed in a way that makes public service uh, to be impactful. In 2014, government introduced Parliament in Parliament, Public Service and Administration Act, that is PAMA, which was adopted as an implementation mechanism for minimum norms and standards. The Office of Standards and Compliance is established in accordance with Section 17 of the uh, Public Ad Administration Management Act. The key object of the office is to improve compliance with minimum norms and standards in government institutions. The Minister for Public Service and Administration monitors compliance to minimum norms and standards in all three spheres of government, noting the distinctive 
interdependent and interrelated character of government. Three frameworks have since been developed to operationalize the Office of Standards and Compliance in line with Section 17 of PAMA. It is hoped that this colloquium with diverse stakeholders will interrogate these norms and standards and issues of compliance just for the purpose of improving the work that already is being done. Reports of the Auditor General, DPME, Public Service Commission, and other institutions show that there is a slow decline in compliance in specific areas across public service and administration. The state of public service reports and the state of the municipality reports also does not paint a good picture in terms of issues of compliance. The Minister for Public Service and Administration issued PAMA regulations in October 2022 for the Office of, Office of Standards and Compliance. Monitoring reports over the past two years have also uh, been developed. The findings and the and recommendations thereof will be shared in the discussions throughout this uh, colloquium. Program Director, I wish you all well on this three-day conference, which starts with this uh, Office of Standard Compliance Colloquium and ends with a focus on human resource management and development. We are building on a significant uh, improvements that have been made over the last three decades, whilst building state capacity to face emerging challenges, which require public administration to think and to work differently. I implore on you to work together to find solutions to improve policy implementation and look for areas where we can collaborate and come up with implementation plans which can change people's lives. This is the key objective and focus of this conference, I have been advised. In conclusion, Program Director, I would like to again remind you of what President Cyril uh, Matamela Ramaphosa stated in his 2023 SONA, I open quotes, a professional public service staffed with skilled, committed, and ethical people is critical to an effective state and ending corruption, patronage, and wastage. To put a rider on this statement, I wish to send a message of hope to all South Africans that yes, for who we are as a people, we can. The resilience we have had during the dark days of this country still lives on. Our deliberations must ensure we address the challenges we are experiencing and come up with clear strategies of overcoming them. This is what is possible. This is what we are hoping that this colloquium will actually manage to do. I thank you. Thank you. Again, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister, uh, for giving us that uh, marching orders. I think we took note of the DM speech. It formed part of the discussion that are moving right now. Uh, if you look at our program, when we break for tea, we're about to deal with the issue of uh, discussions. So we took that break to allow DM to to connect. Thank you very much. I think we should do that. Let me call on the stage. Uh, DDG Tlope. Your seat is here. This beautiful seat here must be used. Um, Acting OEC Ed Renisha. Your seat is here. Kuben uh, Governor. You've got your seat here. Uh, yeah. 
So we have listened to three presentations, colleagues, that were quite thought-provoking, uh, starting from the perception on the failures, uh, bureaucratic uh, governance, thought leadership, service delivery issues. We have dealt with the issue of policies, prescripts, uh, why this office has been established, its main objectives, what it seeks to do. We have listened to Kuben giving us regulations. So we have listened to DM giving us a broad political statement from the SONA, expectation from the SONA, and, um, and the marching orders in terms of the outcome from this discussion on the third day, which is Friday. And the moving beyond Friday for implementations to see a better public service delivery in the next term. So those are the caveats we already dealt with. So my job will just facilitate people ask questions, clarity seeking. I will allow, I will discourage people to give the, the, Kuben, what is this? I don't know, what is this? No, you know, I, I, I don't like theories and then, that's not me, I, I can't do with theory. I must, I'm, you said I must explain to you the definition of colloquium, cology, da, da, da. no, those are theories. The, these people are still here are learned, I can tell you. They are learned. They've re some of them wrote these definitions sitting here. So I can't bridge into them what they wrote. Thank you very much. Uh, on a serious note, Kuben, I can't, I can't tell people what is a colloquium. I can't, I can't do that. So we, we have to look at those. Now, I would discourage people to give preamble statements, just direct to the point and specific to what was presented, and then we take note. I can take first part, second part, third part, and therefore in that response, so that we, are, we know when we leave this room by, by Friday, what exactly we achieved. Thank you very much. So in that note, I've got my three panelists here who presented in the morning. I will start from my extreme left, yeah, with no connotation. I'm just saying start from my extreme left. They will just raise their hand and they take questions, come to the middle left, and then I move. You just stand up. I hope they revolve revolving mic here. Uh, you introduce yourself. Who are you? Where, who do you represent or where do you come from? At least for the purpose of the reports and the minute, you are able to cover, to cover those. And you can still make follow-up discussion. Welcome, DG. Thank you very much. This is our director general, by the way. Who don't know her? She was in the Buffalo Committee. She didn't arrive late. She was in the meeting already in the morning. So welcome, DG. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will start from my extreme left. You stand up, introduce yourself, we represent, and then the question. Maximum three questions. Don't go beyond three. I will take the second round. Thank you very much. Sir, you're on the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, DTG facilitator. My name is Boon Gubane from uh, also the Premier Kwazulu Natal. Just just a few uh, comments for me. I think the first one is um, there was an issue that was raised by the acting head of OSC uh, as to whether we do have e effective rules. And so my view is that uh, I think we do. Uh, as it is, I think the public service is said to be, you know, uh, you know, have a lot of bureaucracy. I think what, what I think for me is important is really the issue of investing more in programs of ensuring behavioral change. Um, that is, is, is fundamental uh, because it, the change of attitudes, because one of the reasons why you really have you sort of have you know, an uncaring attitude in some cases and a high level of non-compliance really has to do with issues of attitudes. And secondly, you must remember that public servants are drawn from society. So what you see in the public service is a reflection of our society. And therefore, I always hold the, hold, hold the view that South Africans are very, not so much you know, patriotic. 
think investing in programs of patri that will instill values of patriotism is very is fundamental to me. That will really say that will tell you that this behavior is inimical with the behavior with the values of society. The last one, which is a question really from DDG Shope, is is really the issue of saying how do you bring about a balance between the, the issue that you have said that there is really a lot of you know obsession with compliance and templates, APP, vis-a-vis -vis, you know measuring of impact. Uh, how do we bring about that balance? Because it's true indeed. Does it not really call for us to maybe to revisit some of our templates that we have, but uh, so that we focus really on, on impact? Thank you very much, Chick. Thank you very much, and then thank you. You were spot on on my brief. The next one, take the floor. Thank you, Program Director. I, my name is Ngaka Tsakhai from Tswani University of Technology. I would like to focus my attention to Mr. Tlope. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation earlier on. I just wanted to find out from you as a labor specialist uh, that since in South Africa we have so many uh, acting DDGs or DGs, some have gone through the disciplinary hearings some are still to go for disciplinary hearings. Some their disciplinary hearings have been elongated for a, such a long time. It, it amounts to years sometimes. I have checked the last time I checked, it was something like we had six DDGs who have been uh, uh, suspended. And at the same time, we are talking about representing all the 57 million people in South Africa. So all those people are looking at us to implement change, which we aspire for. You spoke a lot about leadership. And in leadership, if our people are suffering, then we should be suffering with them. What is it which you are doing or we are doing in terms of expediting all those disciplinary hearings so that we get proper people to be implemented or to be appointed so that they can implement change. Because for as long as a person is an acting person or on, on, an, on, a, on a certain position, he is not actually mandated to take certain decisions because he will have to consult because it, it is not actually a, a, an incumbent of that particular position. So that is also an efficiency of some kind. I would also want to uh, say to uh, Kuben, uh, this compliance, you spoke about the fact that once this system is ineffective, once it is effective, it will show you all the areas of need in throughout the country. And then if, for instance, there is a certain need of capacity, do you have enough staff in order for you to be able to uh, 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 adequately serve and uh, capacitate all those departments wherever they shall be in need of your service. Because if you are not having enough staff, then it is as well going to be unproductive and they will blame you at the end of the day because they shall have depended on you for immediate resolution of their problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Anyone? Thank, thank you. Take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, yeah, mine is uh, it's also directed to Mr. First, introduce yourself. Tell us where you come from. Firstly, I'm Lawrence Tipani from the DPSM. So my mine is directed to Mr. Trope in that. Uh, I appreciate your, the manner within which you define what the developmental and capable states entail. Uh, however, the, the definition somehow omitted or was really quiet on what I regard as the two key important characteristics of a developmental state, namely that uh, such kind of a state is known for having the ability and capability to plan and implement in an integrated and coordinated manner. 
and which is something that is really lacking in our in our situation uh, as you are aspiring as South Africa to be a capable state but also the issue of uh, meritocracy in that uh, it's bureaucracy is highly technically competent and in our situation I think that's something that uh, the NSG is attempting to address through its national framework of uh, the professionalization of the public service. So I just wanted you to just uh, touch uh, on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tsipane. Next send on extreme left row. We are done. Can I move to the second extreme left? If there's any hand here, nothing. You are converted. No, that, that, that ray is no one. I think all of them are, are born again, are converted. They, everything was fine, you know, they, and I said, thank you very much. The middle row, Mr. Alvin. Thank you. Thank, thank you, um, program director. My name is Alvin Rapea. <coughs> I am a retired public servant and I'm here representing Regenesis. <coughs> I, I <coughs> heard um, when Kuben was presenting that the Office of Standards, they will issue a, is what a directive, a compliance uh, order. But that compliance order, it's not that you, you we will assist you in implementing it. Isn't where we go wrong? Because if you are a head of a department, there's a compliance order from this office. Thou shall implement it without a question. I think that's where we should, we should start. This is where we went uh, wrong. And if we are saying we want to deal with the issues that have been identified in the state capture report. This office, the DPSA and this office should be respected. When that letter comes, it's the DG, when he sees this thing on his desk, it must be a priority that it must be addressed. The, 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 <coughs> the branch that uh, uh, is the Fukela had, it's going to do those things. By the time you issue that order, it means they have gone there, they have assisted, or <coughs> they will assist afterwards. But you, you are going to say within six months you deal with these issues, or else DG, HOD, you face disciplinary hearing. That's, that's what you do if you want to instill uh, discipline and professionalism in the public service. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, retired public servant. Uh, <laughs> next end, in the middle row. Okay, can I go to my middle right? Can I come to this row? None. My extreme right, there's a hand here in front. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, colleague, uh, Mr. Bukela. Um, may I start by acknowledging the DM, the Minister, and the DG of the DPSA. My name is Matume Malachi. I'm from the Office of the Public Service Commission. Um, my question, uh, I'm directing it to Mr. Klope. Just a direct question. Are we a failed state? Uh, full stop. Then the other issue there is um, you told us just do your job. Every institution for us to get out of where we are. We heard you loud and clear. But um, I also just want to agree that our compliance order must be prescriptive. 
it must then give options. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Malachi, from the PSC. Any hand on my extreme right? Okay, so far none. We have dealt with the first round, so I will I will allow the panelists to to present and then don't present political statements. <laughs> um, deal with the issue. If if the issue is not clear, let's allow that will find way because we've got this tendency of going to meetings of this nature. Public servants tend to become politicians. We talk political statement. The time we leave that room, the situation remains it is. So these are important questions asked by colleagues. I will appreciate that we start in that order. You have taken notes on my extreme left. You will respond to those questions to who, and therefore we move. Uh, Demisan, you can start. OK. Uh, thank you, Chair. And. Um, yeah, just to recognize the DG as well. Okay, let me address the first one that uh, Sbu uh, raised. Uh, how do we move from compliance to, to impact? I, I think for me it's an evolutionary issue. If you check at how uh, the South African state has, has operated since 94, it has been growing on an incremental you know, basis. So it, it's an evolutionary matter as far as I see it. I just think that at this point in time where issues of service delivery are very pronounced uh, in the front of the citizens, it is, it is now more important to go the impact, to, to check the impact route. So if you are looking at what should be done in terms of focusing initiative on state capacity, it has to be done at the focal point of service delivery. But that also means that from our planning process, we must be conscious that we do want to do impact assessment so that when we craft our, um, you know, our APPs and our monitoring and evaluation plans, we consciously and deliberately factor in that out of the 10 projects we want to do, perhaps we can take four or five and uh, subject them to impact assessment to the extent that the citizens uh, would benefit. So it, it's, it's a conscious decision that has to be taken in the process of planning and execution. Interestingly, Sbu, uh, the Harvard School uh, has done a research that says in the UK, 70% of, uh, of private sector do not realize their goals because they never plan for the execution. So they, they, they go and do their, their APP at Mahalis Beck, uh, they come back, but they don't factor in how they are going to implement this strategy. Now, once you undertake that implementation, then you are able to measure the desired impact that you want to apply. So it's a conscious issue that we must do, uh, but we, we must consciously move out from completely thinking compliance, 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 and routine into what are the intended goals that we need to achieve with the plans that we have. Uh, the second one is that this one should have been asked before the DG came in. Uh, the one about acting. <laughs> <laughs> the timing is not proper, Chief. <laughs> 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 I, here's my position. The, the person who's acting in a particular position bears the same responsibilities and obligations and the leadership roles and managerial roles as anybody else who could be full-time in that position. I think, I think that's the basic principle. You can't say, I can't do A, B, C, D because I'm acting. Your, your, your responsibilities and obligations and your incentives, by the way, the salary that you get is the, is the same salary as the full-time guy. So you, you can't say I can't do A, B, C, and D uh, because I'm acting. So that would be a wrong principle. Secondly, I, I think we need to be more geared towards building organizational culture and performance so that we, we, we avoid personality cults in organization. So if you move into the DPSA, you should be guided by what are the ethos and values and organizational culture of the DPSA. 
uh, and not necessarily coming in and you are acting in a particular position and you become larger than life. It's about how you fit in into that entire organization. So, so from an appropriate governance perspective, you need to build an organizational culture within which people should operate rather than being overly preoccupied by the individuals. The individuals must, uh, must you know, must fall in within the culture of the organization. Uh, what was the third one? Um, Lawrence, I agree with you. An essential part of a, a well-capacitated state is the, is the ability to integrate and coordinate. The question is, is, is how do we do that? Uh, for me, you need to pick up, because usually we talk about these issues, but it's difficult to implement them. So what happens in some cities, for example, the, at, at a city level, what they will do, they will say, let's say the city of Swane will provide the whole of Gauteng with water. And then they'll say the city of Joburg will provide the the whole of Gauteng with um, electricity, for example. And then they'll ascribe to the city of Ekurulene something that they must do for them. Now that forces all the aspects of the Gauteng to, in, to coordinate to work together. I think at an organizational level it's possible. If you are going to pick up specific projects and pick up people not simply because they belong to a particular branch, but because they have got the capacity to collectively drive that project. So rather than preaching, you pick up few projects and you create a multidisciplinary team that will compel people uh, to work together because they have the same thing to do. It, it, it's something that I think um, you know, it, it should be done. But next to that, there's also the challenge that we usually incentivize individuals rather than collective activity. So if you want people to collaborate, to coordinate, and all of that, to make sure that they, you, you, you incentivize you know, uh, that value. You know, I agree with you on the issue of meritocracy. I, I, I just have a bit of... Um, meritocracy is key. In fact, I want to believe that since 94, everyone got into government because they qualified one way or the other because they have two degrees, an honors degree, and all of that. But I, I also think we must be a bit cautious that in this country there's been a trend that when you bring in black people into an organization, the question of meritocracy arises. So, so suddenly in the early 98, 96, when black people started getting to the rugby, there was a question of whether you are appointed because you are selected into the, the what's that? Um, Quota. Yeah, Quota system. yes, because you, you so we, we have been, in a way, this issue of meritocracy is very important, but I think we need to be slightly conscious about it and how we talk and manage it. Because when we appoint a white person, the question of meritocracy usually falls away. When you appoint a man, Usually is not, uh, uh, you know, you appoint a woman, they ask, who does she know in that department? Who does she do? Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. So, so we, we, we shouldn't have this blanket, you know, you know this blanket to talk about Mary Cross. It has got its own dynamics, and I think we need some kind of consciousness so that when we talk about this meritocracy, it's not simply because we now have a black government in place and suddenly meritocracy is an issue. I mean, you, you select someone to play cricket for the Protea, they say, well, because he's black. Uh, the cricket, the Proteas are not winning because of the transformation. You, you, you get that just uh, leadership. So I, I am for meritocracy, but I think we need to put it in a particular context so that we don't associate merit, uh, lack of meritocracy with a particular uh, race and gender. Um, the last one, are we 
a failed state. Don't answer when uh, I don't trust you on this question. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my direct answer. Uh, the answer is no, but there's a but. There are disturbing seeds that are on the ground that if we don't escalate our performance as bureaucrats, we might end up in a failed state. So if Buitumelo was here, she will be talking us about a risk that, you know, if we don't do A, B, C, and D, the issue of a failed state is a risk issue that if you don't mitigate it, it might materialize. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dumisani. Uh, next one, Renisha. Um, thanks, DDG. I, I think mine is just from Mr. Ngobani. Um, I agree with you. I think a lot of our compliance and, and the way we do business generally in the public service hinges on the behavior of people. And unfortunately, we've, we, it's very difficult to regulate how people behave, how they interact with each other, and how they generally conduct themselves. So we, we're not short of rules. We have a code of conduct. We've signed a service charter. We've got the values and principles. We've got many, many regulatory uh, mechanisms to tell public servants how to behave. And I think the question is, why then do we still have people who misbehave or who don't conduct themselves in a professional manner that then requires us to highlight in all our presentations, we aspire to have a professional public service? Um, I, I think the question's out there, but that's my view on it. I think it's a diff difficult area to deal with. Thank you, Renisha. Kuben. No, thank you very much. I think there were three three questions I'll try to to respond to. I think our colleague from TUT talked about uh, this compliance monitoring system. I think maybe uh, Renisha should be better able to answer that, but I'll try. She will come in. I think I'm, I'm reminded by our DG. Uh, she says. She's reminded us in the office and others, we don't need electronic systems. We just need manual processes to be mapped out first in any organization when monitoring compliance. That's the first step. But as the office, the office has a mandate to set up a compliance monitoring system, which will have on the top end an early warning system which will be able to be all the red flags, all the, the institutions that are mediocre, all those ones who are doing well, and those ones who are not doing well, be able to give you those indicators that can be able to say, intervene before it's too late. And you are right. While the OSC is building the system, the DG will look into the capacity for those people who are going to manage that system Kuben, at some let, stage. Let me assist you. I said I don't want mm. preamble. Okay. The question is says, OEC must issue compliance order which are direct, no, that's and DPSA must be respected. The response should be there. So don't worry about okay. the preamble we can read. So no. do with the response. I'm responding to the TUT person on the system. I'm coming to that uh, program direct. Uh, so there will be that system which will be created. Of course, the DPSA has to work together with COCTA, who is responsible to create the system for, for local government. And each of those systems will have to talk to each other to have an integrated, interoperable system, uh, just to answer that part. Uh, the, the question raised by uh, Mr. Rapia, my former colleague, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that you're in retirement already. Uh, uh, Mr. Rapia, uh, the, 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 the process that we are trying to take as the Office of Standards and Compliance is to use a, a developmental approach in building capacity in institutions rather than going straight slapdash compliance order. So the process, as I outlined in the presentation, we will engage, conduct capacity and functionality audits. 
The audits will raise certain issues, will sit with the institution and the accounting officer and the relevant people, develop directions for them to improve, give them some time within that directions for improvement. Then we will sit down and develop a compliance improvement plan with the organization themselves. As, as I stressed, each institution is responsible for the improvement of their own compliance. The office is there to come and support that process, not to interfere or take over any powers or to confuse anything. I've stressed that from the beginning in the presentation. So there will be this compliance improvement plan with timelines and we will then monitor together with that HOD that plan. Failure to do that, then we issue the compliance order. It is more a developmental approach in building because we, we do know that from experience in going into certain provinces and national departments, there are capacity issues and capacity problems. So we need to identify what are those capacity challenges, make recommendations for that improvement, and of course that head of department improves. Um, my Colleague, Mr. DDG Malaji from OPSC, uh, we, we take note, yes. The compliance orders will be very specific and, and prescriptive. Uh, we are waiting for our DG, DG to approve uh, a resource for that person who's going to come and assist us as an advocate uh, to assist with the legal issues about the compliance orders and so forth. We're hoping by next month we should have a resource to, to, to work with towards this, this orders and all the, the legal implications of such. Thanks. Thank you very much. Colleagues, uh, I want to move to the next part. But before I give the DG, I want to check if there is a burning question one. There are two. What, uh, what announcement is he making? Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Chairperson, uh, morning DG, morning colleagues. Um, these are just from the online platforms. Proceed. On the Zoom, we don't have uh, much questions. Uh, I see the questions are only on the Facebook. The first one from Leonard Sanders. Um, we we need change to great uh, progression, reduce the number of years required. And the second one from Pranita uh, Bechu, what about hiring a competent workforce for the delivering of excellent services to the public? And the last one from Lulama Kilichana, Please note NQ levels optioned through learnerships and challenges uh, with the assessor, moderator, learner not receiving certificate after hard work. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let me, those are comments. Uh, there is one burning question there. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. I just wanted to make a follow up to Dr. Klope, Mr. Klope, and that is that, is that uh, the outgoing minister of DPSA, Ms. Ayanda Tlod, in one of her press releases, announced that 62% of our staff members are not qualified doing the jobs which they are employed for. What is it which the department is doing to rectify that, to implement drastic change which must be seen on the ground in terms of service delivery? If we are not going to make this a talk show, what is it which we are going to be doing, which has been done ever since he, she pronounced that? What has been done in terms of uh, re remedying the situation? Thank you very much. Uh, I said only two. Let me take the one at the back. Let me bias a bit. I've been taking questions here. One at the back. 
thanks, Chair. Sorry. My name is Sonwabu Shibani. I'm from the Department of Cooperative Governance. So my 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 question is not necessarily a question that will end today, possibly to the team that is up front there. In respect to the question that um, Renisha asked about compliance, my answer to that is yes or no. Compliance does assist at some point. It inhibits or impedes our work. My view is that we need to look at what are the things that we do from an HR perspective, given that this is an HR con convention, that assist line function to be able to do their job, from recruitment to training, or from your job description or organizational design to the last point, so that our compliance is not driven to inhibit service delivery. The second point is, given that we are coming from different sectors, possibly to the presenters and those who are still to come, to ensure that we achieve developmental goals. How are we going to ensure that the district development model is implemented and it achieves its goal through the strategic plans and APPs that departments are developing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Response? Uh, the, 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 the DG has volunteered to respond. Yeah. No, yeah. DG, DG <laughs> want to say something. Yeah, yeah the yes. 62%. <laughs> <laughs> Respond. It's only one. I only had one, one question. Yeah. It's the unskilled stuff. No, no. No, no, I'm covered. We are covered. No yeah. response. Yeah. Okay. DG, you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Morning, colleagues. Anyway, I raised my hand to just comment on a few issues. So I don't know how I got to answer questions, but there was one question that I uh, said I will attend to. I think it was the one about staff members who are not qualified and the question of what have we done about it. Uh, I don't know if Nico wants to answer that because he has, he's the one who's been doing the work on it. But I think uh, to close the matter, for now is just to say that um, our processes are such that we have assessed, we have developed a report which um, has been handed over and I hope it finally reached, um, the last time I checked it was in the ministry, I hope it's reached PSC. So we've done a comprehensive report, we've looked at, we've interacted with departments and looked at uh, our information. We have never had 60 something percent of colleagues who are not uh, 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 62 uh, percent we never had we never re released such figure I think we're initially at 30, 30 something percent can't remember exactly now but if minister spoke about 62 percent I don't know where she would have got that figure from we we when we started we were at 30 something percent the numbers we've cleaned up the numbers because we picked up one of the mistakes in the system was that we put people from law enforcement as well and yet if you look at uh, law enforcement, they have different requirements for SMS members. And this is just at SMS level, it's not across. So we've done a lot of cleanup of the data that we have sent to um, ultimately to the minister. I think now we're standing at about 400 and something, 300, 400. Okay, I don't want to commit myself because Nico is shaking his hand. I don't have my figures here, but the numbers reduced um, uh, significantly. But even though the numbers have reduced significantly, there's areas of concerns we have categorized. There are those, I think also what pushed up the numbers, there are those colleagues who were appointed before the 2016 regulations uh, who qualified to be appointed in those positions. 
And at a policy level, the question is what happens now? Because you have colleagues, maybe a colleague qualified to be a chief director at a metric or a director at a non-metric, whatever the story was, prior to 2016. But some of the colleagues have not improved themselves, have not um, 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 uh, taken opportunity offered by passaries and etc. to also improve themselves. And the HR departments have not had engagements with those employees. And this is across government, it's not just one department. So from a policy level, what happens to those um, departments and etc. And you would ensure in any, you will know in any case that uh, if a person has been appointed in that portfolio at a, during a particular time and the rules change, the rules do not apply uh, um, um, uh, to that particular individual. So th that information is with the Public Service Commission for investigation. If it is not, it might be delayed in the of office of the minister, but I think we will confirm that uh, particular issue. We have all were also in engagements with um, uh, NSG and the DHET around a recognition of prior learning um, a mechanism being input to assist some of the colleagues. We've also done an analysis. Um, and, uh, some of these colleagues, and I would say a number of them, it's not worth even doing interventions on them because they are at the age where they are facing retirement in three to five years. So there's no point of uh, putting interventions in terms of them getting qualifications. But I think you will see all that data um, um, uh, that we have collected on this matter. I agree broadly, TDG uh, Vugela, on the comment around intervening at the level of behavioral change. And, but unfortunately, the bureaucracy is structured in such a way that people want to issue more rules. I think that we have saturated ourselves in terms of rules. What is important is how to intervene to assist people to leave the values of the public service, which are prescribed in the constitution. Because if we move in terms of that, I think we are going to get a, we've got, gonna fix a lot of things because values can be learned, good values can be learned, and bad values can be unlearned. So it is a social construct in any way. So they can be learned and unlearned. So if we focus on you know, uh, uh, values education, values awareness, we, we are likely to assist people to know what doing the right thing means. You know, doing right, the right thing, whether somebody is watching you or not, they will know what that means from a values perspective. It's only then that you adopt it from a values perspective that, or ethics uh, a perspective that it helps you. As you are doing your work as a public servant, you are able to say, I shouldn't be doing this because it is incorrect. But if you don't have that value system, and unfortunately a value system, uh, values are personal in the sense that you have to adopt them, you have to be prepared to live according to those values. So that's the journey that I think in partnership with the PSC and other colleagues we need um, uh, to traverse and we need to find innovative mechanisms of how we engage. I think it will help us to improve our culture and, and do a number of things differently in the public service. So I'm hoping out of this HR, out of this conference, broadly the three days, we'll come out with some really good ideas around how do we move forward from a values perspective, a values-centered public administration, because I think uh, that's what we need more than the rules. Yes, the rules play a role, but to just throw the rules um, uh, in an environment where there is no compliance in any case to those rules, because our environment here, there is minimal compliance. I mean, there are departments who don't comply with anything, with a single regulation. But again, I heard somebody talking about uh, disciplining people. DPSA cannot discipline another HOD. DPSA cannot discipline another DG from another department. My minister, MPSA, can only discipline me and the teachers in his portfolio, perhaps like Busani, uh, because PSC DG, I think it's a different process, I don't know. So we, every time we pick up a non-compliance, we have to write to, my minister must write to the other minister. So if the other minister doesn't do anything about it, the best we can do is to escalate the matters to cabinet and parliament, and that's the end. This is my experience in the department. That's it's been the end. You escalate and nothing happens after that. I think lastly, DDG, I, I thought um, the, the issue around systems and the commitments that uh, he's making about me, uh, uh, the gentleman sitting there. Uh, I just want to say that I think 
I don't want people to live here with, the underst with an understanding that DGTPSA is not supporting development of systems. But my point is, let's fix our processes. The system is not going to fix a process for us. We must fix our processes first. We must have our processes and know what our processes are. Because the system automates your processes and maybe take out some of the areas of your processes that will be obsolete because you're automating into a system. But in an environment where you don't have processes and you just want to impose systems, you are going to run like headless chickens, in my experience. So it's important that we fix our processes and then roll out the systems that we want uh, uh, to roll out. I just thought I must clarify that. And I, I also think that um, uh, the, 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 the OSC is a new, is a new um, uh, unit within TPSA. And I'm saying unit within the TPSA because it is currently a chief directorate within the department. Yes, the legislation sets it as an autonomous entity or independent entity from the department, but in terms of the structure and in terms of the current financial situation in the country, a decision was taken not to have another entity of the department because we don't have a budget to support an entity. Um, and, and, and also learning from our experiences with CPSI, because CPSI is an entity of the department, or is a, they don't like to be called an entity, they have another word for it, but uh, I can't remember it. It's a government component of the department, but they don't have sufficient resources to do what they need to do. So they, therefore, they are a chief directorate in, within the department, and my conversation with them has been, just prioritize one thing and do it well. And I hope that in our annual operational planning conversations, I'm going to see what exactly are we prioritizing, what capacity do we have to do what we are prioritizing. If we can just prioritize one thing in terms of that legislation and do well, because we have a phased-in approach in terms of implementing that legislation and what it's imposing on us. We can't do everything. So when I hear about enforcement, I even wonder if you are at a stage where you are going to be able to do enforcement. You, you don't even have an enforcement officers. You don't even have money to employ enforcement officers. So where do we start and what is it that we can do? I also don't want us to raise too many expectations for colleagues who are here on things that we are not going to be able to do because of the limitations that we are facing. Sorry, DDG, I took a little bit longer, but those are the issues that I thought let's clarify. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DG. I could not stop you. Uh, that is that is that's career, career limiting. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you very much, colleagues. Let's clap hands for them. While they are leaving the, the couches, go to sit with your chair. <laughs> now, let's move. Let me get a presentation by um, Ms. Ivy Matloha. Uh, no, you, you told me that you're not going to give them anything. Now you're giving them anything. You said nothing. Don't confuse me. So let me get presented by Ivy. Where is Ivy? Can you can you ascend here? Okay. She'll give us a presentation, and therefore it's about OEC compliance monitoring report. Just give us uh, that presentation at high level. Don't read it word by word. Yeah, I'm managing time. Yeah. So people are sitting here minimum. They've got six degrees, so they can read. Don't read one word by word. Thank you very much, Ivy. Protocols? How does it work? Minister? No, no protocol. <laughs> Good afternoon. Is it afternoon? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to just acknowledge uh, Deputy Minister, I don't know if, she, I don't think she's still connected. Um, I'm told that no protocols, but <laughs> just to acknowledge also DG, DDGs, HODs, uh, invited speakers, guests, all colleagues, all protocol observed. I'm just going to present to you on uh, compliance to public administration norms and standards. This is based on the report that we have produced as the Office of Standards and Compliance during 2020-21.
which was approved by the minister. Thank you. And uh, the draft report for 2021-22, which uh, has not yet been approved, is still at the draft stage. Uh, much of the background has already been stated by my colleagues who presented earlier, uh, how the Office of Standard has been established and operationalized in 2020. And according to the PAMA, we are expected to monitor compliance with public administration norms and standards and to develop an early warning system. So the presentation just seeks to, to give update to, to that uh, areas of compliance that we have reported on in our reports. And we'll present a bit about the overview of the OSC and the non-compliance and the compliance by departments. And also just to share the roadmap going forward. On, on the problem statement, uh, we have a lot of problems as government, and again, my colleagues have presented about the challenges that we have, the findings that we get. Uh, Renisha went into detail about that. But as public servants, we need to understand what the cost of non-compliance uh, does uh, what non-compliance does uh, to our service delivery and how it affects uh, citizens. So the failure to comply with legislation is one of the root causes of the material instances of non-compliance and audit, audit findings. And the AG has consistently raised these issues. And most of the issues that we have uncovered as OSC center around issues of recruitment and signing of performance uh, agreements. This just presents uh, what I would call the model, um, OSC compliance monitoring model. We start with the setting of compliance requirements and the promotion of compliance. Then we monitor the compliance and then we have to respond where there is non-compliance. We communicate the results and we do support and interventions. And I don't think what my colleague Kuben was saying was that um, we, we, we are soft or anything when we issue orders. No, that's not what he said. What he was saying was that before we even go to issue orders, we have to support the departments to find out the root causes of non-compliance and try and intervene and you know, assist where we can before we can even uh, say that we are issuing compliance orders. So it's, it's actually regulation by providing clarity other than by enforcement. Enforcement comes at the end. Our compliance monitoring theory of change, uh, we believe that if we have committed leadership leadership that is committed to consequences management. And if government employees have adequate skills to implement, monitor, and review, and if you have adequate human and financial capacity, then you will have less maladministration and more efficient and effective use of resources. That will lead to improved service delivery and improved quality of life of, for, for all citizens. Uh, 
I sometimes say that when we see people protesting about service delivery, as public servants sometimes not directly involved with uh, service delivery or not working in those departments that directly work with the public, we, we remove ourselves from that. We don't see it as our issue. But the thing is that our non-compliance ultimately leads to to those service delivery protests. So this is, this is just the overview of employment in the public service as we present the, the report findings. And I will just start with the limitations first, just putting our cards on the table and saying that we have some limitations here. And the first one is about the absence of that electronic system. The manual capturing of data has, has its own limitations and of accuracy and you know the information you have to depend on what somebody put in. There is no a way of picking up if there, there have been errors or omissions. Uh, and the other thing is that information is available only on a few compliance areas. So the report only analyzes those areas uh, that we have information on. And the mitigation there, my colleagues again have already talked to the early warning system that we envisage will assist us in getting um, improved data uh, quality amongst other things and also reducing the burden of, of reporting in departments. The other limitation there is that for the 2021-2022 information verifications are still in progress and the report will only be finalized uh, at the end of March or during the first quarter. Uh, we're just going to look at the demographics, uh, the overview of employment in the public service. Over the past two financial years, the number of public service employees has increased from 1.4 to 1.46 million with declines that uh, are observed in among male employees across all the races. So there's decreases there 3.4% among white males and 0.5% uh, among males in general. We are not going to speculate as to what the reasons could be. I'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, this slide just presents the compliance to recruitment and appointment of women in SMS positions in line with the prescribed standard of 50%. And this one focuses on the provincial departments. What we have observed in our analysis is, is that while a few departments, provincial departments, have achieved the 50% standard, none of the provinces had an average of 50%. So when you aggregate, then none of the provinces, even though within the provinces there are departments that have achieved that 50%. And across the board, in provincial departments, we have seen that and observed that education, provincial education departments are lagging behind, while agriculture and social development have made some strides in, in this area. And that's for provinces, not national, again. On, on this area of compliance, uh, we outlined the root causes, what 
we uh, our engagements with different departments came up with uh, the budget constraints over 70 percent of the departments we've engaged have indicated that this is an issue for that affects their vacancy rates and affects obviously uh, other areas such as employment of women uh, some have also indicated that their annual recruitment plans have been withdrawn and what is concerning here is that those withdrawals sometimes happen even with critical positions. There are slow implementation of organizational structures. Um, there has been increased increases in turnover rates due to early retirement. And in this instance also, a lot of departments mentioned that HR planning is their biggest concern they actually need, they are struggling in, uh, in this area. There's also poor monitoring and evaluation and no appetite for consequences management. The next uh, area that we looked at uh, is the compliance to appointment of people with disabilities in the public service. We have observed year on year slight decreases in the numbers, that's a 0.3% decrease in numbers of people with disabilities. And the decreases mainly are in the category of African males, white males and white females. And this in, in terms of males is just following on the overall trends. Um, in terms of the provinces, national departments as well as provinces, let me start with national. Um, the Department of Women, Youth, People with Disabilities, we can see that it's really leading by example there with 5% um, and it's the highest among all departments. I think that the only change that maybe this department, this department can consider is also putting people with disabilities first. Um, I watched a program where people with disabilities were, were saying that why are they appearing last in, in the nomenclature of this department? Whether does it mean that they are the last ones to be considered or they are less important or what. So other departments are also over 2% and even 3%. And you can see that a lot of departments really are, are trying to comply in this area. The root causes of uh, non-compliance in this area. When we talk to departments, they talk to the issue of lack of awareness of what constitute disabilities and what can be disclosed by people when they apply for jobs. So a lot of people with certain types of disabilities are not aware that they can actually state uh, whatever it is they, they have as a disability. There is also lack of partnership between policymakers and civil society in general. And poor understanding and poor training. And I mean, in government as well, we, you don't really get people, I don't know, maybe in other departments, I've never heard of people going for sign language training, for instance, but we want uh, people with disabilities to, to come and work in these departments where like there is still an us and them uh, divide. We have some success stories of departments that really try to increase their uh, compliance due to some drives that they have them backed on. So we need to find innovative ways of enabling and ensuring transformation in the workplace. 
some departments have even referenced the the funds really to say that they're going to appoint with people with disabilities for those posts and they are replacing people with disabilities with people with disabilities. On the compliance to SMS vacancy, uh, vacancy rate of the standard of 10%. When Renisha presented earlier, she, she asked the question, what really stops us from doing our work? And I think that this is one area that we need to really look at because how do we even expect to deliver without having decision makers in our departments? Uh, this is something that is concerning that there are departments with SMS vacancy rates of over 40%. The causes of this again goes back to the issue of budgets, and you have also unfunded posts that are there in the structure. Um, there's also the issue of uh, poor use of audit outcomes. Actually, people just having a not so positive attitude towards audit. There's a department that specifically mentioned that they view audits, they don't hide away from audits. They view them in a positive light because that's the only way they can improve and this is what should happen in all departments. And the other issue that my colleague Ukuben also mentioned that he'll be looking at is what informed the standard in the first place. So this is very important because we cannot keep on saying that we are not complying without going back to, to check really what influenced, what informed this 10% and is it still appropriate even today. On the management of delegations, generally compliance is increasing uh, across national and provincial departments, and it has increased quite uh, significantly because of the workshops that Delegations Management Unit has been conducting with departments uh, following the 2020-2021 outcomes of the reports. So there have been interventions, and these interventions are proven to be uh, giving us some positive results. Departments are telling us that they have a problem really understanding this delegations uh, framework in general, but since we have already started with the capacity building in this area, uh, we expect that compliance will continue to to improve. On, on ICT compliance, we have looked on at the issues of security, ICT security. And these are audit findings by the Auditor General and most of them are really concerning because we are just not taking the issue of security, ICT security seriously as, as departments, as government. You have instances where remote users have accessed certain systems that they shouldn't have accessed. And you have instances where there have not been review of, of access rights and uh, important policies in that regard. Uh, the root causes of this, we, we believe that there is no real appreciation of the importance of ICT security and how it would affect 
the departments and how it ultimately affects service delivery. You have, for instance, that, that picture on top there I, I got from my former colleague, Godfrey, who visited one department in, I don't know if I can say, in Northern Cape. And this is the picture of a server that's just not in a good condition. It's, it's accessible there by everyone and they, there are leaks there as well. So you can see that really we don't take these things uh, very seriously and we need to improve. You also have like people with not the right qualifications working in IT. For instance, a, a labor relations person in one department uh, has been heading the IT unit for 15 years. And everyone uh, working in that unit uh, at NQ, uh, NQF5 or below. In some cases, you find, uh, according to the audit report that my colleague produced, my former colleague, uh, you find department employees using Gmail as their main email because they, they just, there is just no support in that area. On public servants registered on the CSD, uh, this is actually one of the indicators that would help in, co in combating the doing of, the bus of business with the state. Um, Houting was a concern or currently up, up to 2021-22 because there has been an increase there in the number of employees, government employees registered there. And some of the root causes of having high numbers. A case in point is the Department of Health in Limpopo province, where they have mentioned that they have the right system in, the systems in place to pick up when public servants are doing business with the state or trying to do business with the state. So they have the systems that will block that from happening. But on the other hand, other departments won't have such a system. So you will find that Department of Health employees manage to, to bypass that, those systems and then they get work from Department of Agriculture. But who is supposed to get the audit finding when it's like that? So these are some of the things that we, we need to look at because if Department of Health has the right systems and they prevent education department from doing business with health, but education does not have the right systems to prevent health from doing business with them, then health will end up getting findings in that area. So just on the road ahead, um, our plans for the upcoming year. Most of it have, has already been mentioned by my colleagues, the early warning system, I've also touched on it. From the early warning system, we will get, because we're starting with business process mapping before we can have the early warning system. From the business process mapping, we will be able now to have uh, the right key performance indicators or even key compliance indicators, if you will. And so there will be procurement of that after that process. When, yeah, I think that the, the non-compliance there that you see is not us saying that we are expecting non-compliance, but just to say what the early warning will be able to do it will flag and say that I led us to say that, you know what, it seems like in this area there is land compliance loading, so you need to do something about it. So this brings us to the end of my present. I hope that I didn't use much time. Just asking colleagues if we are going to be compliant. From now, I hope we will be. Thank you, colleagues.
Now you can take a seat. Thank you very much, Ivy. Yes, indeed, I can tell you you have used much time. I can tell you that. <clears throat> you have used much time. Uh, it's just that it's because you were a woman presenting. It was Kube. I was going to stop him. So I'm, I'm gender sensitive. You have, because the, the agenda item was very simple. Report on the findings. Bring that two slides. Boom. Report on the findings. The moment you take people on the OEC establishment, legislation, you know, we don't have resources, there's no money. The time you go to your gist, we are sleeping. We are sleeping. So I'm just saying, in, you know, this is how government run. As we can't move. This is why DG said, fix your processes first. The moment you move around, you're the problem. So I guess tomorrow we'll be facilitating. Encourage your people to slide on the issue. Don't tell us you wake up, breakfast, it was raining. No, the issue. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, let's, let's move. Uh, I hope who's coming here will mitigate my time. If you don't mitigate my time, I will cancel lunch, unfortunately. Uh, we have to move. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one, Dr. Taviso Makola. Can you come on the stage? and give us presentation. Your agenda says the Office of Health Standard and Compliance, setting standard. Just tell us setting standard. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Um, let me also take the opportunity to recognize the Minister in Absentia, the Deputy Minister, the DG, the Executive of the DPSA, and um, to say we are from the, I'm, I'm from the Office of Health and Health Compliance. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you. Um, uh, my presentation really is just to share with you um, the issue around standard setting that has happened in the, in the health sector and just uh, as a way of also reflecting on how we've evolved over time uh, to where we are currently. So in my presentation, I'm just gonna touch on uh, the role and the mandate of the and functions of the OHSC, look at some of the reforms that have led to the establishment of the OHSC, uh, the rationale and uh, approach to regulation, uh, implementing norms and standards, and then principles and, regu oh, and, and regulatory outcomes. So, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we never make any assumptions, but um, we are aware that we, 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 as the Office of Health and Compliance, have been uh, around since 2013, but most people still don't know a lot about us. Um, but essentially, we are a healthcare quality regulator in the South African health system, and we were brought about uh, through an amendment of the National Health Act uh, to bring about uh, the OHSC as a healthcare quality regulator. And um, since 2013, um, following that uh, amendment of the National Health Act, uh, then uh, there were regulations that were promulgated in 2018, um, which are called the norms and standards regulations uh, for different categories of health establishments. Uh, basically, those were to allow the OHSC to be able to do its work as a regulator of quality in the healthcare service. And I'm sure colleagues around here would know that one of the things that um, we sort of know about the health, uh, about South Africa is that very often we hear a lot of things that are not going right in the health sector. Uh, so there are serious quality challenges in the health sector. And our role as a regulator is to ensure that we improve, uh, we help the health system to be able to improve to provide good quality health care in the system. So in terms of what the OHSC does, um, you know, in terms of our vision and mission is that we are we, our vision is for a consistent, safe, and quality healthcare for all. And the mission is that we must monitor and enforce healthcare uh, safety and quality uh, standards uh, in the health establishments. So uh, it's important that uh, I make this point that um, the health sector is one of uh, those uh, sectors that are quite highly regulated. So the, of the Office of Health and Compliance 
its, uh, its jurisdiction is over the health establishments. So we, we actually are interested in the health establishments. But as to the actual professionals that work in those health establishments, it's a jurisdiction that lies with uh, the, the other uh, um, uh, regulatory authorities, such as the HPCSA, which is for uh, the Health Professions Council of South Africa, the Pharmacy Council of South Africa, and the South African Nursing Council. So as we do this work, one of our challenges is to always make sure that we navigate the issue of jurisdictional uh, 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 you know, making sure that we don't sort of, we, we stick to our jurisdiction and don't actually o uh, overreach in terms of our jurisdiction. So it's one of those challenges that we currently have because we, we operate in a highly regulated environment. And just to also say that, uh, so in, when, when I mentioned the fact that we, we, we um, the OHSC is a Schedule 3A entity, so colleagues around here might be, might be familiar with the PFMA, it does outline as to the different entities of government, but we are a Schedule 3A entity um, as a regulator. And uh, as I said, we, may, we, are, we are brought through the amendment of the National Health Act, and our, the main object of the office is to uh, protect and promote the health and safety of users. And, um, and, and this is done through two main ways, which is monitoring uh, and enforcing compliance by health establishments with the prescribed norms and standards. Secondly, we ensure consideration, investigation, and disposal of complaints relating to the breaches of norms and standards. So in terms of the legislative mandate that we have in regulating uh, quality and safety within health establishments, um, when we use the word protect, it implies that uh, the state has a responsibility to protect citizens from harm. Um, and I think well, on that point, I think um, while I'm sharing with you is just to also remember that, that in terms of context, the provision of healthcare services is inherently a very risky business. Uh, you cannot completely eradicate uh, risk and harm from a uh, provision of care but we want to avoid, we want to basically regulate to the extent that we actually can avoid, they, they can be, we can make sure that there's uh, avoidable harm because some of the harm that is in, uh, is in the system, it's almost, you know, you cannot, there's no way you can be able to eradicate that. So the idea here is that there is certain harm that is avoidable and that is the one that we need to deal with. And then of course, promoting health and safety of users um, also uh, implies that uh, the state must play an active role in quality and safety uh, of health services. Uh, colleagues here might also have heard um, maybe about two, two years or three years ago that there was a competition uh, commission um, uh, investigation into the private health sector. And one of the things that came out of that commission is what's called the health market inquiry. And one of the findings was that as much as we are highly regulated as a sector, one of our challenges is that there's still not enough regulation. Uh, a lot of people do as they wish in the sector because there just isn't enough regulation. So to that extent, the OHSC, although we are an entity of government, we don't only regulate the public sector, but we regulate both the public sector as well as the private sector. So on this slide is just to share with you um, that in terms of the amendment of the, of, of the Act, it does specify exactly what are the things that we have to do, um, including advising the Minister uh, of Health in terms of the norms and standards that need to be prescribed for the health system, um, but we must also inspect and certify health establishment as being either compliant or non-compliant. Uh, we also uh, make recommendations for intervention. Uh, we publish information in relation to uh, compliance or otherwise. We also recommend to the minister a uh, quality assurance systems that must be implemented to make sure that the health system can improve. So uh, the, then, of course, there are other uh, uh, functions that are outlined in, our, in, in, the, in, 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 the, um, in the legislation, which are almost uh, in terms of that we may, have, we may do them, uh, and, and that is about advising the health system about what are certain things that they can do to be able to... Um, um, to, to comply with our requirements. The, the main issue here is that uh, colleagues around might, might be aware that uh, health is a concurrent function within uh, government, meaning that the National, health de National Department of Health makes the policies, it determines the norms and standards, but it's actually the provinces that render services. So the National Department doesn't actually render services, it's actually the provinces that render services. So that, that concurrency is also an issue, because even when we do de a de a determination of, of the norms and standards, it's uh, there's always good, because the, the policy making is done through what is called the National Health Council, uh, which is made up of uh, the National Minister, 
uh, the, the nine MECs as well as their HODs. That is the ultimate body that makes their, uh, uh, the policies, and it is the same body that also determines the norms and standards. The, uh, for us as a, uh, as a regulator, we advise on what they need to, to think about, but the ultimate decision of the norms and standards that are determined for the health sector is made at the level of the National Health Council. So the, our role, as I mentioned, is also to make sure that we can advise the minister because ultimately, although we are, because we are, we are, a, we are a, a, a national entity, the accounting authority is the board of the OHSC and the executive authority is the minister of health. So we do need to ultimately make advice to the minister of health to be able to then say what exactly are the norms and that needs to be made for the health system. So the, as I mentioned, so, so in terms of the work that we do, it is the norms and standard regulations applicable to the different categories of health establishment that basically is uh, the, um, the what basically that, 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 that is uh, essentially what we use to determine the norms and standards. What, what, what those regulations are the ones that allow us as a regulator to then develop inspection tools that we then use to go out into the, into the, into the health uh, system to then uh, uh, inspect uh, hospitals, uh, clinics, private hospitals, we all, so uh, um, those norms and standard regulations are the ones that guide us to be able to make those uh, um, a, a determination on, on, on the certification and otherwise. So in terms of uh, the powers of the OHSC is that we, we monitor compliance, as I mentioned, we investigate complaints because currently also the Office of the Health, Health Ombud is also located within the OHSC. We also advise the minister, we also recommend and issue guidance. And uh, in terms of the work that we do, once we've inspected a health facility, we decide as to whether it is compliant or non-compliant. Once it has been uh, determined as being compliant, we then issue a, co a, a, a compliance certificate. If it is uh, um, non-compliant, we then issue what is called a compliance notice, which outlines exactly what the areas are in which we have, we are found to be non-compliant and what you need to remedy, and then we give them a chance to then remedy those. So it, our approach to regulation is quite, um, um, you know, incremental and progressive rather than uh, just a big bang approach. So in that regard, um, since uh, the, the, the regulations were promulgated in 2018, um, we have been able to then uh, uh, develop tools uh, for the primary health care, for the hospitals, but we are doing it incrementally and we are advising the provinces to be able to then make sure that their, 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 their facilities or the, the health establishments in those provinces try to uh, um, comply with those norms and standards. So that is uh, in essence how the OHSC does the work that we do. But in terms of sharing with you, um, our experience is that, of course, the issue around um, health systems reforms. It's inherently a very political process. There are a lot of contestations, uh, but essentially what we do is that we determine exactly what needs to happen in terms of uh, the norms and standards, in terms of what, 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 what quality looks like. Because when you talk about quality, very, very often it's, quite, it's used quite loosely, but we need to determine exactly what we mean when we say quality of healthcare. And I can just share with you that for the 2021 and 2022, 2020, 2021, as well as 21, 22, um, for all uh, establishments that have been in, uh, inspected, we're sitting at 20% as well as 33% uh, compliance. So if you think about the fact that the National Health Insurance Bill that is currently through Parliament says that everybody that wishes to uh, 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 take part in the National Health Insurance has to be certified by the OHSC, it becomes quite worrisome from our point of view that when we look at the uh, public health sector, uh, compliance rates uh, compliance rates are very low, meaning that as and when that becomes a reality, we are going to have a big problem with a lot of the uh, public sector health establishments not being able to meet the compliance requirements and therefore not being able to get certified. And if they are not certified, it means they cannot take part in the na in the national health insurance. So these are some of the, the the concerns that we currently have. But from a point of view of where where we are. Um, this is, it, it's really a, a marathon and not a, a sprint. It's gonna, you know, it's, it's made up of a lot, there are a lot of challenges in the system. Uh, in terms of the Office of Standard Com Standards and Compliance, we're hoping that also, you, you will also do your, you also uh, sort of proceed on your own path. But generally, these kind of things tend to take too long and uh, they are quite uh, contested, so you, you must be prepared to, you know, f uh, to, 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 uh, for the long, the, the long road ahead. So in terms of what we do as the OHSC, we find in that, um, yes, we, the, 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 there's one part of our work that is technical, but 
uh, the other part is that we also need to be politically aware of the implications of the work that we do. So from our side, we just wanted to say uh, to the Office of Standard and, the Standard and Compliance, um, good luck on this journey. It's going to be a long road. Um, but we will, be, uh, we will be there to be able to share experience with you. Um, but just to say to you, one of the things that we do is that the health sector has a lot of problems, but at the same time there are also good pockets of quality that is there. Um, but our role is to make sure that you as citizens of the country can be assured that when you go to health establishments, you are given quality health healthcare services. So with those uh, few remarks, let me thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. You have saved my time. Thank you very much. Mufen bonus, Yamatoho, please. That's a bonus you can take home. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tabiso. Okay, DPME. Uh, Kuben, come, you want to say something? Uh, you are talking sign language, and the USA must be trained for sign language. So, um, those who want to be trained, come over. Okay, don't distract me, Kuven. I'm, I'm so let me take DPME, and then we'll we'll break for lunch. We'll have a very short lunch because still have got a panelist to discuss after lunch. So, uh, Honourable Hank, come. <laughs> Thank you very much. How many minutes do you want? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 15. Fifteen. Fifteen. Thank you, you very much. Okay. Good morning, colleagues, and uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. And again, apologies for my DG. I remember when the, the new Pope was elected, he still told the, whoever elected him, he says, God will still punish you for your choices you made. So I, I hope God will not punish you for allowing me to speak. Okay. So I, I think my my... My, my, my brief was to, to talk about norms and standards and policy development and, and how and life cycles and all those type of things. So, so this graph just gives you our policy cycle. So what we do find, and, and we mean to, okay, how does this laser work? But okay, we, we, we probably meant to start at the the thing called diagnosis. It's it's about nine o'clock in our on on this graph. We normally jump in there by twelve o'clock. So you know normally we get statements and say you know there's a problem and we need to fix it. So the public service we we always just want to be seen to be busy doing something. So it, we. And then we start doing stuff. I remember, it, luckily it hasn't come up lately much, but in the past, somebody, you would ask somebody, so okay, you, you instituted this policy, and you know, so, so what was, why did you do this policy, you know? And, and they would say, no, minister said we must. So, so okay. <laughs> so I think what we are saying is you have to first understand the problem. First look at what is the problem, what's causing this problem, and then you start sort of developing your, um, do your problem analysis, and then you start sort of under, uh, making choices, looking at what's my options and, and those type of things and going forward. So, so that's sort of the first process. And you'll see in this graph, I, th I think um, norms and standards probably suffer from the same thing as us in monitoring evaluation. People use it as one word. It's one thing. So in, I don't know, I, I was looking at this and saying norms and standards are about, or norms, sorry, <laughs> I do it myself. Norms is about the behavioral change that you're after. So, so, so that, that, that's what a norm is for me. A standard is saying, what am I gonna do to result that, that change. And, and you'll start seeing this coming through in the next slide as well about sort of the whole uh, theory of change. But okay, so for me, norms and standards is in planning, in, in your diagnosis actually, where you're starting to say, what's the problem? 
what are we trying to fix? One of the previous ministers always asked us and said, so what's the evil you're trying to kill here? You know, so let's understand why we do things. Um, and and that's, that's where your norm starts coming out and say this is the behavioral change I'm after. And evaluations, all of us know, evaluations is there to see did the theory of change hold? Did the change that I was after, did it actually happen? So that I'm saying that's part of norms. Okay. So, and then we say, obviously, then you've got to start, if you know what the problem is, you know what you want to fix, then you've got to start saying, okay, you know, my theory of change, what am I going to do to actually result these outcomes and impacts that we're after? I'll talk a little bit now, now about outcomes, impacts. And for me, those are standards. So that's where you start sort of laying down the standards and, and going forward and do that. And then, yes, hopefully we all implement. And uh, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, our problem is in, at implementation. Um, and I know years ago, I used to make a statement that says, yeah, we have good policies, but we're just not implementing our good policies. And then one of the good academics reminded me and said, but if you have a, you can't call a policy good if you can't implement it. So, yeah, so I've stopped saying that we have good policies. Um, okay, so, so we'll... Um, and, and that standards and stuff. And for us at monitoring, sorry, if there is no standards laid down, if there's no indicators to say how you're going to implement, at what standard you'll implement, we can't monitor. So yes, standards is, please, we need standards to be able to monitor people again. So, so that's, that's how I would see how these two things fit together, and yes, we can't do the one without the other one. Um, so, uh, okay. Oh, I must click that one. I think my multi-skilling is, is getting to me. Okay. So, so in the whole sort of planning part, it says you've got to develop something called a theory of change or the lock frame or, or whatever you want to call it. And this is the beautiful stuff around sort of impacts, activity, outputs, outcomes and, and impacts, which everybody talks about. I just, on this slide, I want to say, yes, I think norms are mostly the impacts and the outcomes, you know. What do we want to change? We want to change poverty in the country, we want to change inequalities, we want to change unemployment. That's what we want to change. And then it's the outputs and, and, and those. So, and for me, those are the standards, as saying, yes, what is my output? Then I, this morning, a lot of people talked about, yes, we must focus more on outcomes and impacts and, and all those things. I'm saying no. We must focus on all of these things. You cannot, you actually cannot change the outcome. Uh, there, there's no ways. I, you can't sit here as the public service and say, I will, I will halve unemployment. How are you going to do it? What you, the only thing that you, as the public service, can control is the inputs, the activities, and the outputs. Those are the only things you can control. A result of what you do so a result of what's the input you use. That's, that's where we, we, we have this thing around unfunded mandates and unfunded policies and regulations and saying, you know, because we don't look, our first slide about problem analysis also says you must do a situational analysis. You must understand what is my current environment. So please, you have to then say, is the money available? You know, is the resources available? Is the skills available to actually do what I want to do? And sorry if it's not, go cry somewhere and get over it, and then you do, you, you come up with activities and outputs that we actually can implement and, 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 and write all those things and outputs. So, so yes, what I'm saying is, yes, we have to look at outcomes. And that is all about testing 
whether my theory is holding. So yes, my assumption is if I use this money resources, I'm going to produce, I'm going to do some activities to then produce some outputs. And then I assume, and I'm, I assume that certain outcomes will start being generated. So yes, if I create incentive schemes and all of those things, you know, um, solar panels, the sale of solar panels will increase, more people will do um, rooftop solars and we will have some more supply of energy. And saying, that's what I can control because I want a, a greater supply of energy or electricity coming in. Um, that's part of my other sins is I spend some time with the, the load shedding disaster. Um, so, okay. So, so what I'm saying is we have to assess everything. So, yes, I think uh, some people in the morning were explaining about disciplines, that we drink disciplines. Disciplines is not an outcome. We need to strive to have a healthy society that our child mortality rates and all of those things are actually reduced, healthier society, and then understand where the headaches come from. Let's not just treat the symptoms. Let's treat why are people having headaches and why do they need disciplines to drink and, and going forward. So, okay. So I, I think in short, that is, that's what I think we do have to, to focus a lot more on. And uh, then I just, this is just the, some relationship, what I said, relationship between norm standards and policies. Uh, first, I say, if you have a decentralized policy framework, and uh, yeah, I'll probably give away my age, but or, or how long I've been in this public service. I remember in 99, when we did the public service regulations, I was part of DPSA at those days. Um, the whole thing was about, first the, the question that was asked is how are we going to hold DGs accountable in the system? And then DGs told us, hey, you're not going to hold me accountable if I can't make the decisions, okay? So what we then said is, great, let's create a, a decentralized model where DGs can actually make the decisions and then we can hold them accountable. Okay, but I think Renisha this morning told us about the, the Constitution, values, principles there. It says we have a uniform public service. So if you're going to have a decentralized model, you do have to have norms and standards to maintain this uniformity across. So, I, and I, I think we, have, we haven't, since 99, we have not yet come up with norms and standards. So I'm thinking it's desperately needed, as well as some people were talking earlier about DDM, integration of, of government work across the public service or the spheres of government. I also think norms and standards is crucial for us to ensure that we have integration and I think it's probably one of our biggest problems currently, um, how we work integrated as the public service. And just another point, um, we are finding to hold somebody accountable for an outcome or an impact is nearly impossible in the public service. Because if I go out to the, the minister and the DG of health and say, okay, I want to hold you accountable for child mortality or life expectancy or one of these indicators. Obviously, if, if the indicator is met, they would claim all the credit for it. But if the indicator is not met, they would again inform us and, and try and convince us that they're not the only people that ensure increase in life expectancy. They would tell us about economic development, social services, agriculture, that all has to contribute to that one. So again, I think we also need to accept and understand that managing impacts and outcomes are actually much more difficult than that. But yes, we want to ensure that whatever we do contributes towards that. Okay, so theory of change. And again, I think one thing we're not doing is we're not learning 
from our theories of change. So yes, you've sat down, you've analyzed all the situations and stuff, and then you are developing your theory. So how am I gonna change the behaviors and, and, and all of those type of things? And maybe I'll mention it here as well. The problem we have is if I have a problem and I give the problem to a tradesman, all what they will do is find me a big enough hammer to fix the problem. So the problem we have, if I have a problem and I give it to a regulator <laughs> or, or somebody that sits in a department that does regulations, what do they do? They just come up with, with a set of regulations. So I looked at, um, at the theory of change of, of the Office of Compliance and Standards and yeah, I, I think we, yeah, I, I will have a different opinion. So I, I heard lots of wording about enforcing compliance and all of those things. And I, I have another slide that I'll talk about those ones as well. Okay, so, but again, it's fine. If you come to the, if you implemented your theory of change and you realize that it's not holding, that I'm not seeing the impact and the outcomes that I was envisaging, then yes, it's brilliant, because at least you've understood that that theory doesn't work. Then you can change it. So then please do change it. We, we're unfortunately not very good at changing policies. We, we tend to just um, replace it with another one. Uh, we, and we change the name or something, and then we go on. So, okay. So in planning, yes, norms and standards is crucial. Like I said, norms is, for me is, is what is the evil you're trying to fix? What's the change you want to see? So, so yes, you have to look at norms there. Monitoring, again, crucial because I, as a monitor, I need information. I need some standards to, to, to monitor you against. Um, and then I, I put in there, internal versus participatory. And again, I would just emphasize that your, your standards that you create needs to be participatory. You cannot, from Pretoria, tell us how, what's the standard that needs to be applied. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And again, evaluations, we need to know what is the change that you're after to be able to evaluate whether whether your theory actually holds. So yeah, so I then decided to just give you this slide. And, and I, I need to thank, and I mean a lot of you guys probably still knew or know Jiva Pele. So Jiva gave me a point a long time ago. He says, Hank, if you do a presentation, just do a bunch of pictures <laughs> and you can, you can decide how you present then. You know, you're not fixed. So, Thanks to Jiva, you'll just see pictures from me. But I, I loved what Sabu was saying, and, and, and obviously also Elvin is now, hopefully he hasn't left us. But Elvin and them said, and Sabu said something about, and I think DJ also talked about, that if people don't do things because you tell them to do it. Okay. So by just issuing a regulation, issuing a standard, and telling me that within your regulations you have all these authorities, sorry, it doesn't happen. Um, so this is change management, is how do you manage change? So Kotter is one of the big gurus of change management. He's got eight steps. So the first, so first thing is there, is people need to understand that you need to change. Okay, so I think the AG, the State Capture Commission, I think we have enough evidence that we need to change. But unfortunately, I've also been part of these interventions from time to time. And half of your energy, when you get to, and, and most of the interventions is in provinces, some in, in municipalities, half of your energy goes into convincing that province or institution that they actually need to change, that they are not good. So normally they will tell you it's political and wara, 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 and, and we're actually very good, um, but yeah. So yes, first, everyone needs to understand 
that we need to change. And then it's about creating this common vision. So I think us South Africans, give us a common project, something to rally behind. Give us 2010 World Cup and we, we can deliver it. Give us COVID, COVID, the uh, COVID crisis, or di what disaster we went through. I mean, come on, the, in COVID time, compliance to, to rules were good and not because of the policeman in the street. I think people started understanding why, why is it necessary? It became about themselves as well. So I was washing my hands, I was wearing a mask, I hated it, but I did it because I thought, okay, I'm probably not gonna get ill. So again, in change management, everybody needs to buy into this. So one of my other previous projects, we also talked about the AA. You know, the AA says, I'm Hank Serfontaine and I'm an alcoholic. So what people need to do is admit I have a problem, buy into, and then agree to, to the vision. And then you start sort of working out how it's done. So, so I think I'm saying, please, it needs to be collaborative. It, we need to get that buy-in. People need, need to do it because they can see what's in it for me um, and, and not, because all of us come from a culture of non-compliance. Just look at how we apply the traffic rules. And now you're expecting those people to come into the public service and now do stuff because you tell them to do it. So I, I think to, to change people's behavior, you have to make sure they're part of the process, they buy into it, they agree where you're going forward and, and all of those things. So um, I think I know I'm between you and lunch. Um, okay, here's the question, and some people have also raised it, does compliance matter? And for me, if compliance, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this multitasking thing is. Okay, so I'm saying if compliance doesn't matter, where do you place the, the fault? Oh, I think it's the right one. Yeah, I can skip the other ones, maybe it wasn't used to. Um, I'm saying if compliance doesn't matter, don't, don't blame whoever is monitoring or whatever, you got to then start looking at, again, your theory of change. As, am, am I requiring, so go back to the policy, and then saying, am I requiring people to do the right things? So if, if my outputs that I'm asking you to do, if doing those outputs does not give you performance, increase performance, then you telling me to do the wrong stuff. Okay, so again, I think it's, it's about, we have to set the right standards. Um, and it has to be implementable, it has to take into account, and uh, yes, it has to give us the, the desired outcomes and, and all of those type of things. So I think this is the last one. So all I'm saying, why are we not having compliance? Again, I think some of our policies are not implementable because it did not take in the diagnosis part, didn't take the current situation in place. I, I do think a lot of our policies are beautiful, beautiful um, vision statements. But a policy is not, yes, you can create the vision, but the policy needs to guide you and say, how am I going to get there? And, and that, and not require us to be in 2050 or, or whatever now. It's got to say, what is the situation going forward? Um, peer theories of change, we, we seem to just want to be seen to be busy. So, so, so yeah, I, I think um, that's that. Again, I'm saying we, we're, not, we're not always, and probably in a lot of cases, we don't use the policies to actually manage to change with. Uh, so we don't think about those things. I, I, I was in the week looking at um, one of the regional spatial development plans and there people were telling me, no, no, they are consulting on this plan. 
So this is a plan to develop a region out in the eastern part of the country. Um, and they say, yeah, they have a 90-day consultation program and all of those things. And I'm saying it's not about consultation. So consultation is I allow you to raise your opinions, give me your inputs. I must be seen to have considered it, but I still do what I want to. Okay. And it's all, it should be all about partnerships. It's how we work together, collaboration, all of those beautiful stuff. Um, and our common vision, shared process, and all those beautiful stuff. Then also a lot of people talked about culture. So Willie, I haven't been to Sweden, but I have been to Canada. Let me explain to you. Ten Canadians will walk down the street. And then if they, if number seven comes to the, you know, the end of the pavement, and that little man that turns red and says you must stop, from seven to ten will stop, and one to whatever, six, will continue walking. And it's not because there's a policeman on the corner. It's because they understand that the rules are there for the benefit of everyone. And if everybody plays by the rules, we then would, would have a well-functional, well good society. So for me, we should focus quite a, much more on the commitment for people to go and say, yes, now you've given me the standards, I at least now know what good looks like. So why will I, I, I must do it because I can see the benefit for me, for the whole society in there, taking it forward and then. So, so I would love to see less about auditing and enforcing compliance and those type of things, but convincing people that that is the right thing to do. I think DG also talked about doing the right thing, and, and it's, it's about doing the right thing and doing it right. Okay, um, I think that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hank. Thank you very much. Give him the hand of applause. Now you can take this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, will one day all of us go to Sweden, Mr. Hank? <laughs> uh, when we come back, I think there will be a good behavior patterns. Is it Sweden where... Okay, who have got, who got cars here who are driving? Can we see by show of hands? Who are driving? Only one, two. Okay. Let me ask you one rule. What is the driving rule? Keep right, keep left. What does it mean? What does it mean, uh, Nico? What does it mean? No one, let me tell you, no one knows that rule who's sitting here. No one. You must go to countries where they know what that rule means. You know what that rule means? Come again? You drive on the left. Where? Okay. You know what that rule means? It says keep left, pass. You know all of you. That rule never say drive on the right. It never said if you go to countries where they enforce that rule, the, the right part is only reserved for overtaking. It must always be clean. No car must drive on the right. You all of you drive on the left. You pass from the right, you must come back. That lane must be open so that people can overtake. No, there's some say I, I'm, I'm supporting uh, uh, the Canadian trip by, by Hank. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Let's break for lunch for 30 minutes. Let's break for lunch for 30 minutes, and then we come back at quarter past two. At least by 
two minutes to quarter past, start walking to the room, which is 13 past. By quarter past two, the panelists will start the process. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, I, I asked the ground rules in the morning. I was told we'll find our way somewhere. So this is what I ask. What are the ground rules? Uh, Kuben, I ask ground rules. There's not, we are walking. I don't know where we're going. Okay, thank you very much. We'll follow that Mr. Mabunda, all of us, where is going. Ha, ha, ha.